Hi, my name is Eve Miles, and you're listening to Traveling the Vortex. Keep listening. Traveling the Vortex. We've joined the doctor as he travels the vortex and landed episode number 218, also known as The Unexpected Virtue of Gallifrey One. I'm Keith. I'm Sean. I'm Glenn. I'm Mel. Welcome, Mel. Hi, everybody. How did we get here? You threw me because <laughs> you, 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 vortex. you just said Keith and I'm like, oh, wait, <laughs> wait I'm next. <laughs> I'm last. I... I Table situations. Table situations very. <laughs> I'm very methodical. It's very key in Sean's yeah. world. Some, someone will have to point to me at the end of the show so that I can get because I won't get it. Give the light to Sean to let him know you can go. Yeah. How are you we'll guys? We'll put the training wheels back on. Okay. <laughs> okay. It's okay. It's okay. We, we moved. You sure you don't want to put the bike helmet back on? <laughs> I might need to. We moved things. It's different. I, it will, I will take a moment to adjust I was listening to you. I was enthralled by your intro. By going, Where intro. is he going with this? This is so <laughs> cool. Voice, uh, he had the voice and everything. Yeah, I try. Uh, we're good. How are you guys? What did we good. miss? Pretty good week. Yeah, it was not bad. Good episode, I think. What did we do? <laughs> we reviewed a book. Oh, that's right. We did. We did. He said good episode. Yeah. And I was thinking like episode of a story. <laughs> and I thought, I don't recall. Do- hey, you got your book, Sean. <laughs> I, mean, I did. It, 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 it arrived... Uh, after we got back. <laughs> How far are you? Um, <laughs> the BBC, <laughs> Doctor Who, Engines of War. This sounds riveting. We expect a full review next week. Oh, I, I, I expect to be flunky in French next week. So Speaking <laughs> my, my, my of books, month. that's one of the things I did this week. What did you do? What, I what, actually you do? Uh, picked up the first Virgin New Adventure Doctor Who novel, Time Worm Genesis. So did I. Did you really? I picked it up off the dealer's table, and then I <laughs> saw the price, and I put it back down. <laughs> I actually read it. Oh, Ooh, you did? Yeah, cover to finish. Cool. And, oh, uh, wow, in a week. I, I don't want to review too much of it. Yeah, it's a quick read. It's a, it's about 230-some pages. Huh. It's not a big one. And I'm not going to give you a full review of it, but I'll tell you I gave it four stars on Goodreads. Um, I had heard some pretty decent things about it. And so I, I got curious, and I thought, you know, it's going to be so far down the line before we even get to the new adventures. <laughs> so I felt it was some, it I felt some. I felt it was something that I could, you know, go ahead and tackle. And I, you know, I, could, I read it; I couldn't put it down. I just I blazed through it. I was I started. Now all of it, all the Virgin New Adventures are Seventh Doctor, right? All or? of them except for the very last one, I believe, is Eight. Okay. But yeah, I, uh, it's quite an enjoyable book. It's really interesting. It it does what I've read about the New Adventure series. It's really written for the kids that had grown up with Doctor Who and were of an age where it was they were a more mature reader. So mm-hmm. there is a lot of more mature themes in it. Um, but it still sticks with the spirit of Doctor Who and uh, with the spirit of the Seventh Doctor and Ace. And it's actually part of a quadril- quadrilogy because there's Time Worm Genesis, Time Worm Exodus, Speaking of which, I'm three. I'm a third of the way through it now, and uh, Time Worm Revelation, I think, is the next one, and then oh no, Apocalypse, and then the third, the fourth one is Time Worm Revelation. I plan to do at least the. I I I thought I'd pick up the first book, just read it, but I was so enthralled by the story that they're weaving that I decided I'll probably go ahead and read the quadrilogy and and just yeah, yeah do it and maybe set it aside for a while and then come back and visit the new new adventures. But it's quite fun. I'm excited to. Get to the point where we can review. I would. Um, I want to thank Sylvester McCoy once again for being so awesome uh, in his uh, his con uh, appearances with Glenn. That Glenn has decided to, on his own <laughs> and not part as Vortex homework, go out and read a book featuring the Seventh Doctor. That's, That's impressive. That's it. That's all I did. <laughs> I uh, am completely done with Lego Batman Three. Hey. Yeah. Aside from hundred percent, hundred percent. Except for the DLC. Oh, yeah, I forgot they have DLC. Yeah, so I'm going to download those next week. Sometime. No additional achievements for the DLC, or does They're it not count all... until it, you it, get it? Uh, I, I have, guess you're still at 100%. I, I'm at 100%. Right? Yeah. I have the Platinum, and that's for the base game. So now I just have the DLC, and there's five packs total. Or I trophies, I guess it is. Yeah, it's trophies for me. 
But I did watch a couple movies. What'd you watch? Birdman, The Unexpected Virtue of Ignorance. Or, yeah. or The Unexpected. It is so good. <laughs> I I went into it kind of trepidatious, as I do most uh, Best Picture nominees, and was just wowed by it. From the cinematography, to the directing, to the acting. Uh, really, all the actors should have probably won also, because they did such a good job. Edward Norton is phenomenal. In all categories that got Academy Awards, except <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <think> categories. <laughs> Which and Michael Keaton does such a good job in it, and it's the trailer does not do the movie justice. It's the trailer makes it look very trippy and very crazy, and it's much more about this guy trying to become relevant again and do a great piece of art and some of the problems he encounters and the difficulties he faces, including other actors, aka Edward Norton. And trying to creep creative control and all of this other stuff. It's so engrossing and so fascinating. So there's some parts of it that I, I struggled to kind of keep up and figure out what was going on. Because they were kind of vague with, okay, this is this character and this is this character. And there's one, <laughs> one, two, co- two characters that I thought were brother and sister and are they are not. <laughs> As I come to discover later in the that, film. That becomes pretty clear. <laughs> yeah. At that point, I was like... Either he is really twisted or they're not actually brother and sister. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go with they're not actually brother and sister. <laughs> well, because the character is so dedicated to his performance that you know, he feels that the only thing he ever does that's true and real is what's on stage. And so everything off stage is just whatever. So, yeah, it's, I highly, highly, highly recommend it. And it's one I'm going to probably rush out and buy because I think I'll even watch it quite a bit. It's that good. Cool. I feel so horrible we didn't get to watch it. <laughs> and then, so, we've directly followed that up today with another digital rental of Theory of Everything. Which is good. It was not Best Picture. Sarah thought it should have been, but Eddie Redmayne was phenomenal as Stephen Hawking. And it explores much more, I, I kind of, from the trailers, I got the impression it was going to be more the young romance aspect of it. And no, it kind of goes his whole life. And it's, so well acted and very well directed and very well written. It's it's definitely worth seeing. And I, don't I know, know Stephen I, Hawking was really impressed with it. Yeah, and, he and liked his, it a lot. It's based off of his, his first wife's book. And his first wife was involved with the making of it, from what I understand, and approved of everything also. So it, when the people who it's based on give you a thumbs up, you know. It's, and it's not one I'd watch a lot, but it's worth seeing at least once. And that's all I did. We watched um, two and three quarters movie. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we 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 <laughs> we can't go into too much detail on that one, but we did because we've been on the Studio Ghibli kick. We started Palm Poco, uh, which is a um, <whistles> bizarre little movie. It's fun. It's, it's fun. really fun and cool. But it's it's about raccoons and this um, uh, shape shifting ability. Yeah, they, the raccoons can apparently transform along with foxes, which I did not know. I always assumed. Did you? Yes. <laughs> I, I assume this is another piece of Japanese lore that I didn't know. <laughs> that, that, that there is, that, that they have this myth of the the, the shape shifting raccoons, but the the raccoons are being uh, oh, forced out by the encroaching human habitations, and they're kind of you know fighting Trying this to fight back. guerrilla battle. But they're raccoons; they're lazy and goofy and like to party, so they don't really know what to, you know. So uh, we did that. What was the um, okay? So that was the three quarters. That was the three quarters one, and then we watched. Oh, we watched Four Rooms, finally. Oh, oh wow. Yeah. It's been on our, our Insta Ricky, queue for, yeah. for, forever. And um, have Not you guys ever seen that one? Yeah. Okay. I think Years ago. I believe so. It's the yeah. Tim Roth one? Yeah. Yes. I kind of feel like we watched about two-thirds of a, of a movie with that one, too, because of, <laughs> of the Four Rooms, the, the, the first two, I mean, no disrespect here, they really felt like somebody owed somebody a favor. Because these were directors that I'm not familiar with, and I, I've never heard of their work or, or anything, and it kind of showed, like, despite the fact that you got Madonna to guest star, this was just not well put together. The third room was done by um, Robert Rodriguez, and it really felt like he was gearing up to go to a Spy Kids movie or something. <laughs> because it, kinda, was, it, yeah. it just, it just <laughs> had that feel to it, and it was fun and quirky and everything. The last room's Quentin Tarantino. Maybe I'm biased. 
Oh man, you the, are. Mo- the movie is like worth owning just for the last segment because no, it is the last, so good. I remember the last two rooms being better than the first. Yeah, two. yeah. Bruce Willis. But the, yeah. everything else was just kind of like, eh. and, and I kind of we we okay, yeah, let's watch that one. And we kind of sat there through the whole thing, going, "What?" It kept me awake trying to figure it out. I was like, are we going to get back to the other room new? Well, I knew. I knew that these were four different four different rooms, four different, different stories, stories, four different yeah. directors. But I kind of kept waiting for the last one to be the capstone that brought everything together. I kept well, waiting for the tie-in. That, you do have that character running throughout all that's the a, That's yeah, the only it. tie-in is, is yeah. the yeah. bellhop yeah. or the bellboy. Well, and, except for the one character that runs into the last, uh, second and yeah, second and fourth room. Yeah, she's in, in, in two of them. The same actress playing the same character, but... I, we kind of kept waiting and waiting. Wait, never got there. And then it ended, and the credits rolled, and we're watching all the way through the credits for the cut scene at the end. That's going to bring it all. The, not there. So, that was that was pre, after that was pre post credits. Man, yeah. So two thumbs up for the last segment, and kind of a for everything else. I kept waiting for that card. You know, that card. I asked him too. I said, "So, is there a card that goes this with this movie?" To is there explain a Planet it? of the Apes? <laughs> next card? I said, "Cause I'm." I, but I'm glad we got something off our list. Well, we so. checked something off the list. What was the other movie we watched? Uh, well, that involves the the trip. We oh, went, I think you can talk about that part okay. of it. Well, we we we, we went and uh, so of course we went to LA this week, and one of our big goals you did? we did. <gasps> well, technically last week. Yeah. One of our big goals has always been to go see a movie at Grauman's Chinese Theater. And the last time we were down there, it was like Mysterious Island to the Journey. We went to Grauman's last time. You just didn't go see it. Right. Yeah, we we went, but we didn't go actually go inside. That is not a movie I wanted to see. Yeah, we didn't want to see The Rock in anything at (laughs) Grauman's. No No offense, Dwayne. But uh, so we we, we looked and we kind of looked at just, "Eh, let's see what's playing. Because we knew that we were going to land early at LAX. And we knew we were going to have time to kill until Mitch got in because the room was in her name. And we just kind of thought. Well, maybe we'll go over here. Maybe we'll go here. We, oh, we'll go to Santa Monica. We'll do something. And uh, well, let's see what's playing. And uh, Jupiter Ascending was was playing at Grauman's, and we went <clears throat> yes. So we landed at LAX, and we took the shuttle from LAX over to the hotel, and we asked the concierge, "We know we can't get into our room because it's not our room, but can you hold on to our luggage until the person in the room it is can get here, and we can?" And she, yeah, no problem. Then we took the shuttle back from the hotel back to LAX, and then we rode a bus from LAX to the train terminal, and then we took a train from there. Midtown, and from there to downtown, and from there to Hollywood. So that Long we, ride. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting parts of town you see on the back. <laughs> Very. I didn't know L.A. had a tram system. Yeah, it's not a well-used one. But. Oh, yes, it oh, is. Oh, yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Not I compared will, to New York, I should Oh, say. I would beg to differ, because... <laughs> I don't, it's not what well, like, it's not as well laid out as New York. So <laughs> it's not as clean as Washington's either. Um, but uh, so we got to, uh, we got there and uh, went and bought our tickets for Jupiter Ascending in the big theater, and it was like oh. Wow. And we walked in, and you guys know me; I'm all about theaters and architecture. This is, I mean, it's supposed to be it's Grauman's Chinese Theater. Oh, it's it's not Grauman's anymore. Well, it's not. It's T yeah. T C L. Yeah, it's still the Chinese theater. It's Grauman's. So we went and saw Jupiter Ascending in 3D IMAX. Very, very, very pretty movie. It is gorgeous. It is a hot mess. <laughs> <laughs> plot wise, oh. well, the, there are some major plot Almost problems. <laughs> I mean, but it's well worth a watch. And in my opinion, there's a couple of fight sequence or chase sequence that's just amazing. It, to be able to see two people act like that, whether it's blue screen or for real or choreography or whatever, it's just amazing to see people move like that and to see it come together in that type of bam, bam, bam movement. <laughs> you, you, you talked about being well shot. Yeah. yeah. This one was well shot. Mm-hmm. And there's a great story. I won't relay it now, but the, the, there's a great story about this chase sequence. And we went seriously. And that was kind of the selling point. It was yeah. a lot that I didn't huh. want to go see it anyway, but now I have to go see it. Um, it borrows very heavily from Fifth Element and Blade Runner and mm. Dune and Star Wars. And so you, 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 you just kind of, in your head, you're watching this science fiction thing unspool and you're going, check, check. <laughs> I can see where you got all this stuff from, which was a little no, unfortunate. There are no original stories anymore. Yeah. Um, and I, it's true. It's a compilation. The, 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 but there is a couple of original pieces, and that's one thing I've got to give the movie prop because... And I'll be the first to admit, I don't have memory retention for nothing. But in my 43 years of seeing a movie, I've never seen anybody put... Um, you think, okay, space movie, you're going to see rocket boots. 
Yeah, everybody see rocket boots. They weren't rocket boots. They were anti-gravity boots. They were anti-gravity skates. Skates. Uh, <laughs> that was just awesome concept. Magic, magic Mike rollerblades on gravity. <laughs> it was. It was That was really cool. cool. It was cool. It was really cool. No, it was. It, it, it's, <laughs> it's, it's what I want to see. It's definitely. This sounds weird. It's definitely, despite the plot problems and the oh uh, man, it's definitely a movie that you should go experience in the big screen just because of the grandeur of how awesome it looks. But yeah, the the, the plot suffers a little bit from just not quite. Not quite getting and, there. And the biggest thing of all, Sean Bean doesn't die. <gasps> Spoilers. <laughs> but that was the other movie we watched this week. So, what did you guys think of the Oscars? Well, let's, can I let's, say let's bore Chrissy a little bit? I had uh, yeah, yeah, poor Chrissy. We won't dwell too much on the Oscars, but um, I do want to bring this opportunity to say that um, my son, who has been talking about the Oscars all week long, decided that he was going to host an Oscar party. So it was Aww. fortunate that we were staying home this week uh, to watch the Oscars because the kids have school early in the morning, and Holly has school early in the morning. And so we had decided that this year we're going to watch from home. And so Mason got all excited, and I helped him print ballots for us. And he and I made pizza for everybody. And he sent Mom to the store to get um, special goodies and snacks for the for the night. And then he went and uh, gave everybody a ballot with their name on it. And we all filled them out. And then he took them and, and distributed them so that other people could check ballots. And he was just... Really, I mean, he was really into this this year, and and so it was a lot of fun. So uh, that's what we did. We watched the Oscars, and I was unprepared this year. <laughs> Most of this, the you Oscars know. actually snuck up on me this year, and it was it one of those seems things like it's where a bit earlier this year than the yeah, previous years. And, and Dave Euler, a friend of ours, we've talked about many times on the show. He usually hosts an Oscar, but we we used to kind of rotate it between us. It seems like since he got his theater, we got. We kind of gravitate to his house, but he sent a message this we week. We have a theater. It's like, yeah, we're holding it at your place. He, he sent a message uh, to our house, or to our house, to our Facebook accounts and said, hey, you know, we're not doing something formal this year, but if you guys want to come over and watch, give me a yay or nay. Well, when we decided that we were just going to stay home this year, we, I messaged him and said, no, I, I think we'll just watch at home this year. So that's what we did, and we were pretty excited. So the path I was going down there was I usually do a lot of research and and I look into a lot of things, and I try to see as many films as I can. And I didn't so see near as us ashamed of ourselves. I didn't <laughs> see near as many films this year. I didn't follow follow near as many of the uh, precursor shows as I normally do. And so when it came down to it, I only end up getting about ten of them right. So I got ten also, and I was I've at least watched more. That might have helped you this year. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, that helped me get uh, Eddie Redmayne. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because I saw his performance and was just like, yes, he's got, if he doesn't win, he's robbed. If and Sean would have been home 10 minutes sooner, he would have thought it out and not done the Indian dance that he did when he got that one wrong. <laughs> did you guys do anything else? Should we move on to news? Let's move on to news. Let's move on to news. News. Uh, as you probably saw exploding social media, Michelle, uh, okay, sorry, season Nine spoilers for possible spoilers from here on out. If you want to stay completely spoiler free, skip forward a few minutes. In other words, an hour. No, no I don't think we're going to talk that long about it. Uh, Michelle Gomez is returning to the show in the role of Missy. Dun dun dun! Is, is anyone, anyone really surprised? Yeah, is yeah. anybody? I was surprised by that. Uh, I mean, would have not liked to have known, but you mean she surprised. wasn't? Not killed? <laughs> it, it's going to be in what I was kind of yeah, surprised it's by. Who, so she could come prior to her death. That's so. true. I am. Uh, what I was kind of surprised by the fact that it's in the two part premiere of The Magician's Apprentice, and now we know the episode title of episode of the second one, The Witch's Familiar. Ooh, that's a good title. That's a, that's a good title. I James, want to see some animal. James, James has hopes that this uh, that the magician's apprentice means that uh, we're going to deal more with the Merlin myth. And then when I laid the uh, uh, witches uh, familiar on him, he got very crestfallen. I was like, "But if Missy's maybe playing Mor- Morgana, you know, we, we can still go there." <laughs> and he got excited again. So uh, they've also announced a few more guest stars in series nine, um, including Gemma Redgrave. So Kate Lethbridge Stewart, we assume, is returning. Um, Which kind of placates my fears that we talked about last yeah, week. Yeah, she wouldn't be coming, coming back. Out. 
Uh, also guest starring, which it'll be interesting to see how this works. Uh, let's see. Claire Higgins. I'm wondering if she's going to play a different character than Ohilla from Night of the Doctor. Hard who, telling. Who, who was she? She was the main sister of Karn. Oh. Oh, the sisters, yeah. She was the main one. The witch's familiar. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> who knows? We <laughs> stop. <laughs> I like winding our listeners up. <laughs> and also, Kelly Hunter, who was previously on the show as the shadow architect in Stolen Earth. So that was the pale lady with, with the, the shadow pl- proclamation. Yeah. And there are other guest stars that we're not going to talk about because I don't recognize who they are. <laughs> <laughs> to be in. If Keith don't know them, we ain't talking about them. And sometimes I do know them when we don't talk about them. <laughs> sometimes we don't know them and he imdibuzz them. So count your stars. <laughs> Lucky that we're not this going there today. <laughs> What's next? Up next on the, ske- or on the, on the schedule, <laughs> jump to the end. I'm sorry. It was the way I asked. Okay, well, uh, what's, next on the, what's next on the schedule? Uh, we discussed previously on the show that the City of Death novelization will no longer be done by Gareth Ro- uh, Roberts. Uh, but it, it has gotten an author, James Goss, and a release date for May 21st. I don't think That's we had a quick turnaround. We, I don't think we had known the author before. We just I, might have slipped under a I guess he had a full script to work with. So. Yeah, <laughs> and, I, and I, I, I'm presuming I'm sure that been that's probably been in the works. For, they just were ready to announce it. Yeah, I would assume so. I mean, it's, it's, I, and, and it's very to possible. be released this year still. It's just now. Got a more of a it, it did kind of fall off our, off our radar once Gareth Roberts left the do, writing. Do, 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 um, does does he have any um, credentials listed without without having to look him up? I'm just I'm just curious uh, if they say author of no no. It gives a great description for City of Death, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> I feel a little Shh, don't don't read it out. We don't want to <laughs> know what happens. <laughs> I, f- I feel a little bit like the guys in the uh, montage sequence from Major League looking at the lineup of players going, who are these guys? <laughs> I'm sure he's a fine author. Um, I could have adapted City of Death for them. They didn't ask. But you didn't apply. Nah. Uh, yes, I did. I think I applied on the show, didn't I? Mm-hmm. Pretty they pretty listen to the show. Sure. So. I'm, pr- I'm pretty sure I, I told the BBC that I could do that for them. <laughs> they did They did not call me. A quick... I even checked email. <laughs> <laughs> I even checked my Facebook status. That's kind of a big one. People can I sent you a Facebook message. <laughs> I downloaded that dumb messenger app just so that I could put a stop to that <laughs> business. Okay, fine. You win. Everybody's messaging me on Facebook. Uh, so you guys know this is not his first Doctor Who novel. He is he wrote Dead of Winter and Blood Cell, which were both 12th Doctor novels. Both 12th Doctor novels. And Summer Falls. Oh, the Amelia... Uh, no, big... Amy wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> Her name's on the book. <laughs> I think he's padding his stats. <laughs> and I wrote War and Peace. Nobody will check the book cover. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, some big finish stuff. So I wrote a little thing you might have heard of, Harry Potter. <laughs> okay, we'll give him, I'll give him a chance. <laughs> Still wish it had been there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and finally, uh, this has slipped under our radar that it was going to be coming. Yeah, we should have had this announcement last week. Yeah, but we, it was unbeknownst to us that there's I was gonna... quite surprised until you posted something and I said, this was off our radar. I was like, yeah, <laughs> a bit. Uh, it looks like, and they had, the, the Facebook group had popped up, but it wasn't until last week that they started posting guests. Uh, Kansas City is going to be host to another Comic-Con, Kansas City Comic-Con this time. Yay. In August, right? And the guest, yes, August 7th through 9th at Berta Hall. And the main guest of interest for uh, most of our listeners would be Colin Baker. Yay! The Sixth Doctor. There are other guests announced and a lot of comic guests announced. So, Did you see who else was announced? Orly Shoshan. Yeah. <sighs> and Nalini Crinchen. Yeah, Orly Shoshan. <laughs> two, two, two Star Wars ladies. Yeah, Orly Shoshan. <laughs> and who was at uh, Celebration 3? Yes, she was. 
with pictures of her. I might be sleeping alone tonight. <laughs> it's not that kind of picture smell. <laughs> Although they were a bit voyeuristic. Oh, say, you see Sean sitting nowhere, his heart's pitter-pattering. Like... If it hadn't been for that restraining order, they wouldn't have been quite so <laughs> I mean, I just Let me just put it that way. And it wasn't even against me. It was Ben. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, no, nobody even at this table. I well... felt obligated to keep him out of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so that's very exciting. I'm looking forward to the con Me too. And, and seeing what other guests they announce. We should reach out to them. We will. Okay, good. <laughs> you do that, or uh, Keith? Yeah. You're, I'm going to. You're, you're, you're in charge of that. You're, you're the you're the point of contact because you are the sane and rational one. <laughs> <laughs> I have to agree with that statement. We can't send Glenn to do it. He's grumpy, and I'm not to be trusted. <laughs> <laughs> Orly and I have history. They're going to look at that and go, no. Well, I, I'm, I'm a close personal friend of Claire Kramer, who's also coming. Because I, esco- I escorted her to her panel at Planet Comic Con. See, there ago. you go. You got the And end. now you're a <laughs> close personal friend. That's right. Wow. That was a, an amazing two and a half minutes. <laughs> hey, it was more like five. Oh, okay. <laughs> Can we call her friend of the show? She was her, uh, She'd just be personal friend if it was two and a half minutes. But if it was five, she's a close, close personal, personal friend. Close personal I got friend. You. Her and uh, Nick Brendan, who unfortunately was in jail recently. Oh. oh, that was that Nick Brendan, wasn't it? Who's going to be? I the finally put the, the I put two and two together and came up with chair. <laughs> <laughs> poor, poor Xander. I did, I heard the name and just kind of wrote it off as a Power Ranger. You know, I didn't realize. No, that's not a Power Ranger. No, not Power Ranger. Um, <laughs> Buffy person. Buffy, yeah, but he he was he was there, wasn't he? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's why that name's and coming there. back for Crypticon. In that's August. why that stuck in there. Okay, well. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> <Did> on parole. <laughs> it wasn't, I, I, from what I remember, it wasn't that bad of a charge. Could be worse. <laughs> uh, that's it for news. That is. Do we have a Doctor Who legacy tip, 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 tip of the, the week. week? And actually, may I interrupt you all? I actually do have a tip of the week. Oh. Because I found out something very interesting. <laughs> I'm playing, well, I'm actually playing right now, sorry. Um, <laughs> we have a rule against that at the table. That's for Glenn. We do? That's for, <laughs> for Glenn. That's a Glenn. He never Griff. follows that rule. I never <laughs> follow that rule. I, didn't, I wasn't aware of that rule until just now. M- Mitch informed me that the uh, the five-ish girls had to put a, uh, a ban on Legacy during the podcast. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to, maybe I shouldn't say anything. I don't want to air laundry, but I thought I do know a few funny. Weeks I said, ago yeah, I, I think all, we need to get that. I did a few weeks ago. I was getting all excited while we were trying to do a review because I kept dropping time crystals. <laughs> But it, uh, Go ahead. I'm playing with uh, <clears throat> the fifth doctor, whose ability is to drop fifth, up to 15 additional gems. Yeah, I'm not. It's not a superpower. It's his first one. And then I'm also playing with uh, Santa Claus, which his ability is to reset the board. And I didn't intend to do this, but I found an interesting um, little uh, clerk, um, quirk about the game is that if you activate Fifth Doctor's first ability, and then activate Santa Claus's ability to reset the board. Resetting the board initiates that drop, drop the those colors in. in. Yeah. Drop the colors yeah. in. And I, I didn't realize that. that. And it's like, oh, <laughs> it's like when you're fighting. Well, those two are going to come up on my list quickly. I, <laughs> so that was, you know, I didn't know if anybody else knew that, but I thought that that was really cool that. You know, I could reset the board, and I still have my turn. Yeah. So I can still maneuver whatever gems are left on the board in addition to those 15 that were dropped or play my other character's abilities and wipe them out. <laughs> Ooh, nice. That's a good that's tip. Yeah, that's a really good tip. Well, take it. And it works with that anybody that can do yeah. the, because uh, who, else, who else does the gem drop? It's, um, there's quite uh, a few others. There's quite a few of them. Or... First Doctor, I think, does yellow. I the think. third doctor, once you get compl- to Keith's level, uh, <laughs> his, 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 his super ability is a, uh, is a gem drop. There should be and a list out there. Maybe that's what I'm thinking. Viability. Uh, I think Amy, one of the Amy's does too, I think. No, not Amy. No. 
not Amy. Who am I thinking? I know, there, there's several of them, but yeah, because there's several um, oh, uh, reset the boards. Fifth too. Doctor drops green in. <laughs> That's what she was just talking. Oh, about. I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, Keith or Glenn, see. Put the legacy down. I just heard the doctor part. I didn't hear the fifth (laughs) fifth part of it. Yeah, green gems. Yeah. It's somebody I'm playing with. Somebody's on my team right now, and I think I would know this. Oh well. (laughs) Well, yeah, I I thought I thought it was good. good Thank you, Mel. Very good chip. Um, I should mention because this is a bit time sensitive based on how he uh, framed it. Uh, Ben Huvian, who is a Time Lord Ben. Uh, did tweet us this week with a quick tip. It says, uh, Legacy Tip of the Week, Chapter 3, The Beast Below the Vapor. Uh, level paying 34,330 XP, just one round. Blue team perks work best. So um, it's one round, and after that one round right now, while the uh, special is on with 150%, so this will knock down to probably whatever just under 30,000 when you actually play it. But um, right now it's paying 34,300 uh, 30, for, for just one round, and it's a quick round. And like you said, if you do uh, blue team the perk and, and perks, it works really well because you can knock it out right away. So if you want to sit there and farm uh, experience, that's a good level to do this week. Sounds it's good. It's a good level to do any mm-hmm. week if you've got a strong enough team because it is Chapter 3. Um, but uh, right now it's paying 34,330 experience for a drop. So. Speaking you, of chapter three, <laughs> I finished this week. All right. Oh, nice. I'm completely through the end of, of, of chapter three and have all but, I think, three characters that I've gotten dropped out of that uh, wow. that I still have to go back and, and, and snag. And I think one of them's a costume. So. Uh, I feel very accomplished. Now I haven't gone back and played Greyhound one so two separately. Two characters in a costume. Oh. Yeah, two characters in a costume. Right. I haven't gone back and played Greyhound one separately, right. but I'm completely caught up, and it unlocked chapter four for me. You might me. as well not even bother with Greyhound one separately. Yeah, that's now, what I've yeah, heard because it's you, once you've dropped the characters, you've dropped characters. Greyhound one is just those levels. But you can with, go back uh, for the, any of the characters that you didn't drop and play an easier. Yeah, version you can play of an it. easier version of it. Yeah. That might be the way. That to might get be the way to do it then. But yeah, so it unlocked chapter four, and I was so excited. That's my bit of legacy. <laughs> Chapter four, um, prequel or uh, the pre- yeah, whatever, yeah, the, whatever, only whatever like it is. Five, five levels, maybe. Hey, you're you're finished. Uh huh. Was there one level? Was I nuts? Was there one level at, toward the end end of of Chapter three that was just a cutscene? <laughs> yes. Okay. Because <laughs> it it came up and I clicked on it and it gave me the team and I clicked on it and it gave you a little story and it gave you the story. And then it said victory. <laughs> and then, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's And right, I yeah. thought... There is a little like that. <laughs> just, yeah, there is a little like that. Okay. Just, um, just check it. I also should mention that I have dropped... They did the... Uh, they gave us four extra challenge levels this week. And I have dropped all of those <laughs> characters now, too. So... I still have everybody that I need, so I did tell we get more characters. With the exception, I did. Uh, I had a bunch of time crystals, so I did buy the available silence that I have that I have because you can drop two of the five silence, I believe it is. And I so I I went ahead and bought those other three, and then I'm going to wait till I get more time crystals and I'll unlock the or buy the uh, other winders and food. So. Those are the ones, the only ones I'm missing because I haven't had the crystals to purchase them because they're yeah. they're a store purchase only. Yeah. So. <laughs> I have a Keith, you got a, you got a well, tip of the week? <laughs> no, I, I don't got much. <laughs> we do have another tip of the week, and we will have that just a little bit later in the podcast. Okay. So now we go into feedback. That's it for f- that feedback. Oh wait, wait. <laughs> almost said that's it for feedback. <laughs> Woo. Coming up wait, next week. Wait, he's doing the show backwards. Nice. <laughs> Schedule, then feedback, <laughs> then news, and then what we did this week. We didn't fin- finish with that's your Doctor Who legacy tip, tip. of oh, the week. week. It's with me. 
Okay, blame it on that. I'll yep. give you that. I'll give you that. There's uh, skits to I'm this. no longer second in the seating order, so <laughs> I'm missing all of my cues. I, I, I apologize you. for throwing you. We would give you the training wheels, and we haven't put them on yet, have we? No. Uh, our first bit of feedback... Lying in a corner of the garage covered in cobwebs. <laughs> uh, our first feedbacker this week gets an apology because he had sent it in on time last week and somehow it, oh, I, it overlo- I overlooked it in my inbox. This is what happens when I'm not here. List. It is what happens. <laughs> uh, it's from Dan. And Glenn is going to read it. Dan writes, Ding! And other feedback thoughts. <laughs> Hi, guys. Okay, first things first. There was 19 dings during the podcast proper and five more dings after the closing music. Sean, do you want to uh, address this a little bit before uh, we move on with Dan's email? What, 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 what were we doing? We, we actually had to redact some of our emails last week because some people had given us their number. And we didn't want to give it away before we did the final winners that got what the winners get for uh, uh. all of the dings. So we did not... Spoiled that last week. We wanted to wait till you came back so that we could all uh, enjoy the number of dings. And if everybody got the right, correct number of dings, and actually, they were counting dings, which we were helping them along. But it was actually how many times we would say the quest is a quest, which we marked with dings, is, is what it was. So. I don't have a ding. Sorry, you said it. I, I, don't I didn't have a bring ding. the. You didn't bring device. the ding. The device that goes ding. Um, well, congratulations to everybody out there who listened. And re-listened, and <laughs> I shouted a thing. That's how you get re-listenability out of a show. <laughs> We're not above the occasional gimmick. <laughs> um, although, by my count, I was the official scorekeeper during that whole thing. None of you are right. What's the official total? Do we want to spoil that, or do we want to make them listen to it again? No, I'm going to tell how many dings there were. <laughs> I came up with 17 during the podcast proper, an additional three quested. And again, this is not this, not the ding for the sake of dinging, but the the ding in association with the quest is the quest. 17 proper and three more in the uh, in the, in the subtexts for a total of 20. But we would have accepted any combination of those answers, but nobody had the correct combination of those answers. So the podcast rolls on, and the contest rolls on, and the uh, prize amounts go up for next week. Well, you already gave them the answer, so now they. Oh, I know, but now we have it. Now we have a new quest. Okay. <laughs> and the quest is the quest. Um, Ding. <laughs> no, we're not doing that. <laughs> I'm going to. Glenn's going to change the I'm rules. Going to finish the gonna feedback. I'm going to finish the feedback, and then we're going to revisit this. <laughs> So let's 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 push on. Okay. Moving on after rewatching. Why you Day guys asked me these things? I realized a Zygon actually bagged the queen while Tin gave a, gave the rabbit a general warning. That makes me think that the two queens that we see later were both Zygons. That would explain how the machine that goes ding kept screwing up, <laughs> assuming it worked in the beginning. Worked in the begin to work to begin with. It also explains how the Queen managed to handle the alien technobabble and their plot in the Zygon ship. If the real Queen was still being held in the ship and never got rescued by the Doctor, that would explain why she's so furious in the Shakespeare Code. Had the Doctor been married to a Zygon impersonator for a while, he stuck around long enough for a pairing in the name of... Painting, excuse me. In the name of good taste... I'll stop pursuing that line of logic right there. <laughs> what do you guys think about that? It's an interesting idea. I'd never thought of it before. So the doctor was married to a big red rubbery thing. <laughs> full with, full with, uh, suckers. Suckers, yeah. Venom sack in the tongue. Venom sack in the tongue. <laughs> it wouldn't be the first time he's done something weird. <laughs> um, I'll tell you, Dan, I like your theory here. However, I don't think that Moffat intended for that <laughs> idea. I think we're you're probably reading a little more into it than it was. Uh, I, I don't I don't quite get why the <clears throat> queen would the the Zygon queen in the end would give away their plot the way she did because she's a Doctor Who villain. They all monologue. <laughs> yeah, but, but she comments them, on how that's stupid, and she lets them go. So yeah, uh, I, that's well, it's but you, up until that point, got I'm, good, I'm in there. But maybe the Zygon was so smitten. By the doctor. (laughs) (laughs) 
I mean, this was David Tennant. Let's 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 keep that in mind. I think he's got a good theory. The I hair? think he's overthought it, though. <laughs> I'm not sure that's what Moffat had intended, but it's interesting. I like it. I like it, Dan. A thousand points. We'll find out on Easter Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> he goes on to say, also, I think Tom Baker could return to New Who. Two thoughts. One, the moment has been prepared for. The Watcher is the moment. Spoilers, Keith. Huh? That moves him forward to acquire the painting as the curator. Two, if you recall in the Leisure Hive, how he was rapidly aging, or excuse me, aged in the Tachyon recre- Recreation Generator, he said to Romana, I felt like I'd been there in, in there for centuries. Time scoop or transmit him out for more adventures when nobody's looking. Just put a beard and long hair on Tom before he returns. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to do it. <laughs> That would actually be kind of fun. <laughs> I would like to see him try that. That would be kind of cool. I like it. Previously on Doctor Who. <laughs> or, <laughs> and you go back to... <laughs> or at the very least, the Night of the Doctor mini adventure. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, there, there you, you go. go. That could actually work. Uh, yeah. Next, to answer Keith's question, Nick Bridge, excuse me, Nick Briggs does not use his dulcet voice tones while reading The Engine of War. To be perfectly fair, I was concerned about the same thing, but this is not another long, dry listen as some audiobooks are. The whole production is more akin to a big finish chroni- companion chronicle, complete with sound effects, backroom music, and other mood setting techniques. Nick Briggs does an excellent recreation of John Hurt's gravelly voice. He also manages a decent Timothy Dalton for Rassilon, but when he voices Cinder, well, <laughs> I guess that's when he tries to rest his voice. Speaking to too much War Doctor would be rough on anyone, and of course there's our Dalek voices aplenty, so why not Nick Briggs? That's true. Good point. I actually went online after we were talking about this, and, and I think Brittany had also mentioned that um, Nicholas does a good War Doctor, and they have a sample from uh, Audible, Oh, and I listened to it, and they're both exactly right. It's it's nearly a dead-on John Hurt. I mean, it's just well, it's as good of a night doctor he did. I'm yeah, surprised. that's right. He did. Well, that's right. When he read the, uh, he's a multi-talented man, and I did not mean to imply that he would make it for a dry listen. <laughs> I just thought it would be a soothing, <laughs> listen. soothing tone. Yes. Wrapping this up, <laughs> I've really been enjoying Engine of, Engines <laughs> of War, and I'm looking forward to more War Doctor in whatever media they put him in. I'm also looking forward to Sean's updates and report from Gallifrey One. Thanks again, Vortex Gents. Dan from Central Illinois. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, Dan. I apologize again, Dan. <laughs> I had sent him an email when I saw it on Monday. That, <laughs> oh, no, I'm so sorry. Yeah, I, 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 mo- I noticed it Monday or Tuesday, I think, when you... Uh, you got, did you say something to me? Or I don't remember if I did. I can't remember either, but I, I, I noticed this week, too, and I went, oh, I should bring that up, and so I'm glad you caught it. I did catch it. On to new feedback for this week. Although, <laughs> we Glenn and I recorded early last week, Eric, so it's not, it's no one's fault. We threw, the, right. we threw the <laughs> we schedule did. off, so he would have gotten this feedback in time last week had we recorded at our normal time. That's correct. But we That's recorded correct. early. So, so if I had Skyped in to wish you guys a good show, you wouldn't have been here. You'd have been late. <laughs> well, we wouldn't have been at your house at all. Yeah. We would have been mid-show when you would have Skyped we were, in. We in my place. <laughs> Sacrilegious. <laughs> Who's next? Eric writes, Engines of War. Hey, Glenn and Keith. I hope you all had a nice, relaxing time without Sean. <laughs> wow, they really love you. I know. <laughs> it was, you, you know what, I didn't think of this, but it was. It was very relaxing without Sean here. I don't know what it, what, what that's about. I was very relaxed with mine. <laughs> you know. We had a good time. I don't know what you all do to him. <laughs> I'm obnoxious. Okay. We do uh, like yeah. poking the bear. I, I, I am. Admittedly, I'm the high strung one. I mean, really. You do have a bit more. I would say you have more energy than us sometimes. <laughs> okay. I would agree with that. I don't know if I'd say you're high strung. But. Well, my, my, my pre show ritual is to eat four bowls of sugar. <laughs> I'm just going to go on. <laughs> it's four major food groups. Syrup, sugar, candy, and whatever the other one is. <laughs> Honey. Jelly babies. Honey. Honey. Uh, we've spent much 
of today, getting ready for Snowmageddon 2015, I'm going to skip tangents this week and go straight into my review of Engines of War. So there could be spoilers ahead, Sean. Be careful. Should I leave the room? Skim ahead. Okay. Because <laughs> okay. he's gonna skim ahead anyway and read. Yeah. Will I, I, I be spoiled here? Uh, okay. that, read, that's a spoiler. That's a spoiler. Spoiling. That's a spoiler. Never mind. I don't need to read the book. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say that I'm not usually a fan of fiction based on TV shows, mainly because I know that the events of in such stories have no effect on the canon continuity, but also because the writers don't usually don't have the permission to do anything that would upset the status quo. And playing with other people's characters frequently comes off as uninspired at best and uh, dissonant at worst. I make some exceptions for Doctor Who because the lengthy gaps the uh, the show has left and because of the lengthy gaps he show has left in the Doctor's lives give writers some quite a bit more freedom. And because Big Finish's use of the original actors make their stories come alive. The main reason I got Engines of War was it, because it helps flush out a bit one of those gaps that I've that we've scarcely seen, but has weighed so heavily on the show for the past ten years. What I was not expecting, however, was that it would be would so expertly tie in the classic tie the classic to New Who. I just wish I'd seen all the stories referenced before reading this. And is it just me? Glenn, or did this book hint at a fix that us for that story you have trouble pronouncing the title of? <laughs> if you squint at it too long, that is. There's a possible spoiler for you. Does it fix the title? Or is it just the story that you have issues with? He still can't say it. <laughs> didn't fix the title. <laughs> oh, I don't have, I don't have issues with hint, the story either. Hint at a fix for that story. <clears throat> Is there a problem with that story? Is he referring to Castro Valva or Logopolis? Legopolis. <laughs> what? I've not seen either one. I'm not sure. Legopolis. I'm assuming Legopolis because that's the one you struggle with more. Fix the story. I do recall you saying something. About I know. I know what he's referencing. I don't know if it fixes the story. Well, tell me what he's referencing because I'm not the, getting the, the zero room. Okay. Does that's in Castro Valva. Does it fix it? Spoilers. Oh, we talked about yeah, the, we the Zero about Room he, involvement that in one, that story. That one sort of got oh, lost yeah. on him because we hadn't... I knew, what, knew, about I knew what it was, but I didn't really it? understand it, and Glenn did explain it to me. Oh, Glenn explained it to you. Yeah. Does he mean, does the TARDIS fix the Zero Room? Because that was, <laughs> that was necessitated by this book. Did this, I, I don't, I'm not did sure. Did this book hint sure at a fix for that story? So I guess you don't know what the fix is or what the problem was to begin with. I don't know what the problem was to begin with. <laughs> okay. Eric, write in and let us know what the problem was to begin with when we finally review that story. Last. <laughs> <laughs> Legopolis and then Castro Valva. All of the big finish stuff will come Better first. Better yet, just email me. <laughs> <laughs> let me know what you're talking about because I'm, sure I'm not sure I'm following. Uh, he goes on to say, I'm glad to know who Cinder is now that she's in Legacy. I hope they do more with her there. Were you aware that George Mann is a fan of the game and wrote dialogue for the two War Doctors story levels? Oh, 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 In the oh, advent oh, calendar? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> He's not talking about Castro Valva. He is talking about Legopolis. And I think I know what he's talking about, and I will say cryptically, yes. Yes. I know what he's talking about. It was alluded to in another email, I believe. That's all I'll say. Glenn's caught up with the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still lost. <laughs> It's okay because you haven't seen either of those stories. So. Yes, 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 yes. I think it does. Yes. Oh, in fact, I think I have voiced my issue on the show. That's why I thought you cryptically. Had, I don't remember what the issue was, it's, but it's I think not, I remember you voicing an issue. Can you say which episode it is? It's, it's in it Legopolis. Is, it it is Tom's last story, not Peter's first story. <laughs> yeah, Legopolis. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what fixes it. Yes, 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 yes. I think he's talking about interstitials. So interstitials. So. Oh, so I might not have a problem with the story when we watch it because of the book. If if I'm I may be way off base <laughs> now with what he's referring to, but yes, yes, that huh. would that would interesting. Uh, n- we get so excited when we think we know what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yep, we rarely do. <laughs> I like the geography of Europe for five hundred dollars. <laughs> 
Uh, he goes on to write, uh, Knowing this made me wonder if the description of the Predator Dalek show was inspired by the game. But it's probably just a coincidence considering the publication date and the time of the introduction of the secondary colors in Doctor Who Legacy. Hmm. I was a little disappointed in a few aspects of the book. I was really hoping Romana would have shown up on Gallifrey. I also would have liked it if the DMAT weapons had worked a little differently, changing more than just the memories of others. I think my biggest complaint was that the book could have been structured as to have a cliffhanger endings for the chapters. Mostly, I'm ex- But mostly I'm excited. Not just because of this book, but because of the combination of the publication of stories of the Time War and the War Doctor, and the recent announcement that the BBC is started, starting to let Big Finish use properties of New Who. Can we please get Big Finish dramas with John Hurt and Timothy Dalton? Now how about Derek Jacoby? <laughs> I've even had some Time War story ideas, one of which fits right in with the idea of the Skyro degradations and would explain why pre-Genesis Daleks and Dalek history differ from everything after. Another idea I Ooh. had was that... Mm, That's kind of a cool idea. Okay, sorry, Eric. You just... You, 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 you sparked the flame there. That's... Uh, yeah. Okay. Write in some fan fiction, Eric. Yeah. (laughs) We'd gladly post that on our website. Another idea I had was that the Daleks try to warp the timeline of Earth, but the War Doctor, Third Doctor, two versions of the Master, the Brig, and Unit save humanity, but at the cost of localizing the warps to members of Unit, thus explaining the Unit dating paradox. That's another really cool idea. That's cool. Oh, well, I'm fading, so I'd better wrap up Wrap this up. Glenn, if you want, I can give you some ideas for future tips of the week in yep. case you have trouble thinking of more. Send them in. Send them in. Later, Eric. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Eric. And our last bit of feedback comes from Eric again. Eric writes, I guess this is what happens when I send email through the Vortex. <laughs> hey, Sean. If my calculations are correct, I just greeted your co-host a moment ago, so I needed to get to you. I look forward to hearing... (laughs) Nice. I look forward to hearing a more in-depth account of your time at Gallifrey One, especially regarding the feminist conversation you mentioned earlier, as well as, of course, anything regarding Legacy and Tiny Rebel Games. I don't have much to add on top of what me from the past said regarding Big Finish and Engines of War, except for a couple of items. First, a tangent. Our first kid of the year came yesterday. Congratulations. Congratulations. Very cool. Since we change our theme every year, we won't be having any more Doctor Who characters. But the new theme is at least tangentially related. I won't give the theme away yet, but the first kid is a buck named Falcon. If you're curious, I tweeted a picture of him earlier today. Um, their, their kids are goats. goats. <laughs> Kind of figure with you know wasn't actually kid kids yet. Okay, I, well I didn't remember if you if I told you that story or not. No, so. but I kind of gathered from the conversation that it would, yeah. <laughs> not unless he likes big families, it had to have been a goat. Well, our, our first kid of the year, yeah. you know, he's real. <laughs> he's you really have more planning than ahead. <laughs> you got to time it, but you, you you can do it. Um, now some frustrating news. Addy, a.k.a. the Adipose TV, has been doing reviews of New Who episodes, going back and re-watching them in order. What a concept. What? <laughs> and then having live discussions about them on his Twitch channel. Today he did, sigh, the Lazarus Experiment. So when I woke up this morning and the family was sound asleep, I started up Amazon Instant Video and found to my dismay that Doctor Who was no longer available to Amazon Prime subscribers. I know a lot of fuss was being made about Netflix, and that that eventually got fixed before they dropped it. But I didn't hear a word about Amazon. Oh, well, what are you going to (laughs) do? Glenn, you got any insights on that, or is it just Uh, a done deal? Or Keith, do you know? I don't know. I actually had looked into it around the first, because I wondered if it would fall off also. And when I looked, it hadn't fallen off. So I'm kind of surprised it's gone now. I'm going to look now for me. Okay. Well, we'll we'll get more on that in a moment. Oh, Robocop's been added. (laughs) (laughs) The remake. <laughs> Something so, shiny. Sorry. <laughs> scrolling. Scrolling. Now, I already noted that you just heard from me from the past, but I know there's a possibility that before we hear from me from the future, thought Glenn's Doctor Who tip of the week. 
that you we heard from me. Through, oh, this is giving me a headache. From me <laughs> through the future, the, through Glenn's tip of the week, that might be happening just on future weeks. Either way, I need to get to these now with this email. Should I go ahead and read these out, or do you want to save them? No, go ahead. All right, we're going to. Well, wait a minute. There are several. Now nah, let's let's save them. We'll use them as tips of the week. We, okay, we, they will be future tips of the week. Future <laughs> tips of the week, <laughs> and you don't get them now. So. Uh, uh, enjoy, Eric. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. We'll read those tips of the week out at some point in the future after Future You has given them to us in the past. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on it. <laughs> and he is absolutely correct. It is not on Amazon. I'm not sure why it's not anymore, though. I would hazard a guess they didn't and say have it's a list. the same yeah. negotiation thing that happened to Netflix, but Netflix got it hammered out and Amazon Prime did not. That's just a guess. That's unfortunate. They're still available on Amazon to rent, just not to per- uh, on Prime. Hmm. Better go move the classic ones from my list. <laughs> Is somebody going to save that email for uh, a later date? Yeah, I'll mark it. Okay. That's it for feedback this week. Okay. Glenn, stop playing Legacy. And I'm looking at Legopolis here. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so we we went we went uh, to Gallifrey. Gallifrey one. We went to Gallifrey one. The twenty six seasons. Yeah, twenty six seasons, 20, 26 of, seasons of Gallifrey one. Uh, and for me, the most mind numbing thing that kind of came out of this was the idea that there have now been. Just as many Gallifrey ones as there have been seasons of Doctor Who in the original run. I think that's why they called it the seasons twenty six. Yeah, well, okay. but but they they brought that to the attention and to the fact that next year there's more, and that that just kind of you know they're for not going to wait seven years and have a movie. No, I, I don't. I don't think they're going to. Uh, they don't show any signs of slowing down yet. I don't know. That just struck me as weird. Considering I didn't know anything about this convention four years ago before <laughs> Glenn said, oh, yeah, there's a con. We should go. That was kind of kind of it. You have notes. You want to start us off? It is on pretty th- impressive how long it's been going. Yeah. Well, and it was interesting also to hear that, um, I can't remember. It's, oh, I lost it. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> No, first thing we want to start off with is Sean touched base um, Thursday. We did the movie. But uh, most importantly, Thursday starts LobbyCon. And LobbyCon is a really big social event. And uh, I had a goal this year to get over 200 ribbons. (laughs) (laughs) How many had you got previous years? I hadn't revealed this to Sean yet. But I will go ahead and reveal it now. I, uh, Billy and I finished putting the rest of my ribbons on tonight, as a matter of fact, and I have 243. That's total. Total. That includes ours. Correct. <laughs> Our two. Which, we had two. We had we two, two this two. year, so 241 is the official count. <laughs> <laughs> no, I still get to count ours. But, yes, um, one thing I'd like to point out for sure is that, or point out uh, most importantly, was that there was a large amount of new new Whovians this year and that had ribbons. It was awesome mm. to hear them talk about how they found out about the convention, went to the website via, you know, whatever means, and found and seen that people traded ribbons and ordered ribbons before they got went to the con. So and that was pretty cool. one of the awesome one of the best ribbons was a ribbon that said first time attendee. <laughs> nice. I was like, that's awesome. <laughs> you know, that you, being the first time coming to this convention, had enough time and enough forethought to print a ribbon that says first time attendee. So, which is interesting, too, because I mean, the galley, when we went the first year, the galley website specifically says, you know, oh, ribbons is this fun thing, but you're not required to, uh, yeah, uh, you're not required to do it by any stretch of the imagination. It's just a fun, you know, thing. And we went, oh, okay, cool. It's a fun thing. And we had no idea. We had no idea that this oh, was yeah. that kind of thing. <laughs> and then, um, so now now it's a thing. Now it's a, <laughs> you know, no, what are we doing? I mean, I've already planned out next year's ribbon for Pete's sakes. I was at Galley Friday night in the hotel going, I know what I'm going to do next year. This is going to be so cool. But, um, 
Yeah, the, the fact that... Did I burst your bubble? With what? With what? Did oh, yeah, yeah, yeah totally. I, I, you should have seen the explosion. It was like... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kind of fitting. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but just the fact that these people interpreted that differently than we did. You know, because oh, we went, yeah. oh, it's a fun thing. And these people went, we need ribbons. It's our first year. Nobody will like us if we don't do that. And they brought, which I thought was just really cute and charming and, you know, that, that people did that. But there were it's, a lot of first-timers It's this an year. excellent icebreaker. And it so really if is. you have yeah. that advantage going in, then you'll, you're able to meet a lot of people. And everybody that I um, met as we were exchanging ribbons, um, that's the first thing I told them, that you're doing great. That this is what the ribbons is all about, is getting out there and to open the door to people to talk, to converse, to share things that you all have in common. You know, and this is an excellent way to do it. That's what the ribbons are for, is to get out there and break the ice and talk about something that you love. So, yeah. And LobbyCon was, um, obviously, LobbyCon is where you get um, and trade your largest amount of ribbons. But you just, it's a chance to meet people and see people that you've had the opportunity to see in the past and get to see them again and to meet new people. I met a lot of interesting and, and kind and cool people. They're all Hoovians, so. Well, it was fun to see, you know, re- the return of the faces and, you know, see Sal, who we finally put a, a name coat. with. The face. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he commented on Facebook. He says, apparently I'm known as the coat. <laughs> because he always wears his sixth doctor coat to LobbyCon. So when we saw him, I went, hey, it's the coat. And he looked at me and then he realized who I was. And then he got a big, you know, <laughs> big laugh on it, a big grin on his face, which was fun. Um. Ran into uh, Megan and Jerry again, who we'd uh, met our first year down there and every year subsequent. And so we got to see them. And, of course, Mitch uh, uh, came down again. And we didn't realize, we talked a little bit about this. This was her first lobby con. We didn't even, you know, over the head. But she got in so late last time. And, uh, and gotta she was sh- really excited over the ribbons. <laughs> <laughs> got to give a shout out to Vanessa. Vanessa, in I don't want to tell a sad story, but for poor Vanessa is one of those stories where her luggage got lost. Ooh. And she cosplays as River Song. And her costumes got lost. All her stuff got lost. And the poor lady was standing there, and she didn't have any ribbons because they got lost. (laughs) She didn't have anything, but yet she still came to LobbyCon, and she was still there in new clothes that she had to buy because she had no luggage. So, but um, she was a chipper and she still came and um, tried to put on a smiley face, even though she was very upset that the airline had lost her luggage. And, oh, I bet. But, Understandably. Yeah. But, uh, what, Saturday, I think they finally found it. And boy, she was just grinning. <laughs> <laughs> and Sean did get some pictures of Vanessa in a uh, cosplay as her song. Total big transformation. You couldn't even recognize her. So um, I just wanted to say hi, Vanessa. And uh, we have gifts. Yes. That we, we should probably mention. I should open these because <laughs> you can't have all of them, oh. Glenn. Mitch this is, is awesome. This is from Mitch. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? Do- I think we joked about this last time, didn't we? I think we did. We, <laughs> we expected to get maple syrup. 100% well, pure maple syrup. Last time she maple didn't bring back those maple cookies. Right, right, right. 100% pure maple syrup. Yeah, in the pins. <laughs> Did we, you have to check this in your luggage? Because I'm sure this is a, above the luggage. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, the, the we, just, we just threw it in the luggage. But yeah. it, it, it did. We realized when we uh, weighed the luggage coming back, and they were kind of like, wow, this is a heavy bag. And I went, <laughs> well, it's 100 milliliters heavy, and you had three of them. So that's yeah, 300 that's milliliters. There's a gallon they of, are heavy, too. There's a gallon are. of Canadian syrup in uh, my bag. <laughs> 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 that's why. We joked with Mitch, which I'm not sure if she kept, caught the reference or not, that we're going to have to have them chug the syrup, you know. the. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm having the... pancakes tomorrow. <laughs> this, is, this was my pre-show. I've already emptied them and filled them with colored water. <laughs> this is, this is Wait, what I got hopped up on. You must have put a lead the... weight in there, yeah, too, because yeah, it's, it's a heavier heavy. than water. Wow. Thank you, Mitch. So, I, I felt Thanks, so bad Mitch. I forgot my pen. I was going to bring my my Canada pen that she gave us last year, and I was going to wear it on my badge. <laughs> and I got there and saw her, gave her a big hug, and I went, oh, I forgot my pen. <laughs> I'm looking at the expiration date, November of 2017. And I'm thinking, if I can't polish this little tiny bottle off by 2017, I've got a problem. <laughs> That's 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 like two pancakes right there. Yeah. <laughs> well, the way I pancakes. Oh my gosh! I didn't catch it this time. 
Man down. Because the mic. It wouldn't be a traveling vortex if my mic wasn't falling over or doing something. Oh, look, made in Canada. Oh, and, and it it's in be French too. Canadian. Fabrique hey, au no, Canada. You gotta let Sean read it. Remember, he's, oh, yeah, he, he, he speaks, he needs he to speaks French. Are you ready? You should have practiced with Mitch all weekend. Yeah, I've been doing, we yeah, talked we about asked it. her about that. <laughs> Does she, she can, speak any? It's required in high school okay. in, 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 in Canada, and then it is promptly no. forgotten. No. It's <laughs> Unless you live no. in some of the yes, French. It is. it is not required in high school. It is required in junior high. Oh, junior high, oh. you're right, you're right. And then you're she right. said she got to ninth grade. She's like, huh, not. She's <laughs> After that, it's an elective. You can choose to It was elective. Somewhere. She goes, I don't want that, and dropped it. <laughs> of all the places, that'd be the most handy to know French. Yeah, now, no. now, correct me if I'm wrong, Mitch, but I think that's what she said. But I'm, yeah. No, you're, you're right. Okay, I'm going to read this now. It says, made in Canada. <laughs> that's in French. Did you hear that? I translated it for you. translated it. Obviously, I can read this. You are so this, screwed this, this, this year. This part says, <laughs> <laughs> I can translate this part. It says, Canada number one medium. And in French, it says Canada number one medium. <laughs> <laughs> Just, I didn't put an accent. Oh, well, here's a uh, product de Canada. Product de Canada. I will say this the French spell syrup properly. Syrup. Yeah. S I R O P. Syrup. 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 Anyway. Um, and I, I felt syrup. bad because we did not bring Mitch anything from Kansas. I don't know what we'd bring, but. <clears throat> Sunflowers? Sunflower seeds. <laughs> <laughs> we grew these for you here. I, I bought these in the There's airport. There's a local <laughs> <laughs> I bought these at the, at the, at the, in the airport <laughs> here. Sunflower seeds from, from our home I'm state. I'm totally going to do that. I, I bring I'm, you air from my Air from my lungs. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I <laughs> Totally going to do that. We're planting sunflowers. I'm going to bring your sunflower head. Let's not be that person, huh? Mm-hmm. Sunflower. Oh, well, maybe next year, taking a pair of Dorothy shoes or something. <laughs> maybe not... next year, Top City uh, Soda Pop. <gasps> oh, yeah. yeah. You can take yeah. her root beer. Yeah, root I beer. can take her root beer. Okay. Yeah. That's another five pounds in my luggage. <laughs> what a stick Watch one. It. No shoes, babe. Watch it. <laughs> <laughs> no shoes. So that was the Thursday night. We were we did lobby con for, and Sean and I were exhausted traveling on the train and tram for an hour and a half back and forth to... Well, our flight left here at 6 a.m. <gasps> That's an early day. Here. <laughs> you sleep on the plane? No. No. Too excited. <laughs> yeah. Played Legacy. <laughs> That's how we dropped something. My the, phone the, died. The, the, fr- the French book was in the bag. <laughs> the Legacy was on the <laughs> no, 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 no. Look at that. But, um, See, that's what we did Thursday night. We did Lobby Con and, um, uh, and then sat there and planned out our day for Friday. Friday, we started out with uh, the good morning or the oh, ready for, ready for Scaro. Opening ceremonies. Opening ceremonies, yes. And uh, let's see. I'm trying to remember Radio Free Scaro's. Uh, well, oh, two, uh, Chip, two minute Time Lord. Oh, that, I, I listened to it when they released it. That was a really nice thing Chip did. Chip always does a good presentation. Yeah. Not that the guys aren't big of these two. Right. They do. And, and certainly hats off to the guys at Radio Free Scarrow for being able to put together a show and then put it together again. To accommodate certain guests and not it's still being, being there, really good, and, really and then put it together again when they lost another. I mean, they kind of oh, right, right. Yeah, they had, yeah, they, juggling act. They had to juggle a lot of stuff in order to to, to get that in there, and they they kind of joked about it that it was like, well, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> but I, you know, as usual, they that's show business. Be ready for yeah, anything. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, Chip's presentation was once again uh, pretty good, and in fact, it inspired us for a, a topic that we may touch on later. We'll give you some of that in the schedule. Part of the program later. Next thing we did was uh, uh, Friday was the early years. It was with uh, let's see if I can read this. Sir. And Derek Sherwin, Carol Ann Ford, Wendy Padbury, and Fraser Hines. And Derek Sherwin is the script editor slash showrunner. You know, kind of kind of BMOC uh, during most of the Patrick Trout years. And I didn't realize that his contributions were kind of as big as they were. That he was kind of there through the majority of of, of, Tr- of Trouton's tenure and went all the way into casting uh, Pertwee and, and kind of set everything everything up for the torch pass over to uh, to uh, uh, Terrence Dix. So I mean, he, he's he's. He's, a, he's an integral cornerstone <laughs> to, yeah. to the show. It was, it was, he told some fascinating stories. 
Um, and this panel pulled quite a crowd, too. Um, Galley this time, uh, it was in Program B, which generally is a smaller area, but this year they really opened it up and gave it a lot bigger spread, and it was full. I mean, it was... There was hardly any sitting room, if any, sitting room for their panel. So by the time the panel was toward the end, it was standing room only, people standing against the back mm-hmm. wall. It's really nice to see for a classic companions like yeah. that. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah, yeah. it's also not. And uh, we 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 did later in the con. We 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 uh, found Sean and cornered him uh, in a, in a corridor and just you know kind of told him was like, look, you guys have done an amazing con every year that we've been here. This is our fourth straight, and every year you guys have done a great thing. But one of the things being that it's been four in a row for us. We've seen that explosion of people and going from this huge jump into, you know, being sold out every year. And I told him that you guys have done an amazing job with accommodating that. And any hiccups that you've run into have been ironed out, if not the next day, certainly by the next year. You guys have figured out the autograph lines, you've, you've, you've the flow of the hotel, where to put different panels in different rooms and things. And it's really firing on all cylinders as well, far as even I'm this concerned. year with uh, guest canceling at the last minute. Um, unfortunately, they weren't able to print the reprint the programs because that was totally out, you know, not going to happen. Mm. But they had boards up posted in several places, um, notifying people of program changes and adjusting so that there wasn't a gap. You know, they adjusted the schedule to fill those <clears throat> gaps or rearranged. And so, I mean, unfortunately, that was not kind to what we wanted to see because everything <laughs> was all at once but you know they were really accommodating on the schedule changes so but the early years panel um hearing them was the classic opinions fraser hines always a pleasure to hear him talk but seeing carol ann ford and uh when Wend- wendy padbury up there those ladies have not changed when yeah looking at the pictures they look amazing look still they are just amazing and to hear them recount some of their um, times on screen with the doctors, it, just you, you can never get enough of hearing them talk. And then the hour was over, and it's like, oh, it was it was over. <laughs> and both told uh, very interesting stories of their departure and, and the reasonings behind it. That you know they, they felt very frustrated with wanting to do more and not being the the, the screaming, you know damsel in distress, especially um, uh, Caroline Ford, that she, she felt very kind of pigeonholed uh, by some of the powers that be. And it was it was kind of an interesting theme that I felt kind of ran throughout the whole weekend for a show that we've continually talked about, look how well these characters are written, look at what they're giving the, you know, the, the women to do, and, and, and look at all this stuff, to kind of continually come back to the idea that we were stuck getting coffee, we were stuck getting to send this, and we were stuck getting to that, and it just, you know, maybe it's that male mindset that I'm, I'm looking at this in a completely different perspective than you know, obviously the people who lived it, <laughs> but just that, you know, something that I thought was progressive maybe actually wasn't, or maybe it just depends on, you know, the rose colored glasses that you want to put on. But it was certainly a theme that kind of ran through the show uh, with all the panels this year. Um, and then uh, that tied in very nicely um, with later in the, in the con um, when we, we have a surprise guest later, we will hear from Mr. Nicholas Briggs. And while I was waiting to collect him from his table, Carol Ann Ford came over and waited for the fan to finish up uh, that was ahead of her. And they kind of looked at me and I'm like, no, I'm here. Let him talk to Carol Ann. I'm just, I'm just a fly on the wall. I'm just going to sit there. And she kind of gave him the evil eye for a minute and then smiled and said, when are you going to write something for me? Well, I want to do more with Big Finish. When are you going to? He says, I'm working on this thing. And I, I can't reveal it because it was not, you know, it was told to somebody else in confidence. I just happened to be there. So I don't, I don't feel it's appropriate for me to say something, but I can feel reasonably comfortable in saying that there is apparently something in the works for Carol Ann Ford over at Big Finish that will be coming soon. So, yay. But she talked again and again and again about how, you know, she was a dancer. She was classically trained to do this. She's classically trained to do this. She was ready to go out and fight the monsters and do all this kind of stuff. And that they kind of said, no, you're going to cower in the dungeon and, and, and try not scream to scream a little bit, scream a little bit, try not to look so sad. <laughs> I, I think a lot of that is we look for the silver lining and, any that new story, be, yeah. and so anytime they don't do that, we tend to stick that in our minds more. Well, she she had a great comment on the idea that you know she and grandfather have been traveling for who knows how long before we we catch up with them on Earth, and that after that, when the adventure starts again, she says, you know, they've been out in the universe, they've seen all these wonders, they've seen all these magical things and, and amazing things. Why is the first reaction to meet a monster for me to scream and, you know, 
that should be, hi, how are you? You know, why is that? And why is my wardrobe so lame? <laughs> she says, you, you think in all my travels that I would have picked up a piece of clothing to take with me? <laughs> Apparently See, not. No, no, no. So after we got done with that panel, we spent the rest of Friday until early, until about 6.30, um, getting autographs and uh, uh, meeting the people uh, that we wanted to meet. Uh, so we did, most of the Friday we didn't do any panels. We just uh, got our autographs, which we got. Ta-da. This, this is our Wendy Padbury. Ooh, Ooh that's, that's a nice one. I knew, nice knew they'd like Mel pick this one out. Yeah. It's like, ice I Warriors like, I in the background. Ice Warriors. And, which we are reviewing Wendy. this week, so yeah. isn't that cool? Yeah. And then this is Keith. Oh, wait, no. That is not Keith. Where's Keith? <laughs> <laughs> Keith isn't here. Where's Keith? I don't know what you did with it. Well, we lost Keith. Oh, no. Oh, Keith. I'll find Don't look for it. You don't get to see it. <laughs> my autograph. And then our, our Caroline Ford. Of course, we're doing this great, wonderful bit on the show where nobody can see exactly what it is. It's a, really it's a picture, picture of the first doctor and, and uh, Su- uh, Susan. <laughs> her name escaped me for a minute. And Carol. Carol. <laughs> and Carol. And then our oh our Tegan Tegan and Tur- or t- Nissa t- Nissa <laughs> we looked high and low trying to find an appropriate Tegan photo for for uh, Janet Fielding and we finally settled on this one because in my mind they've always kind of had the sister act you know they've always been siblings almost and so the fact that we got them both on that photo so I was like now we just need to have uh, Nissa come to a con yeah would be yeah. that would be awesome. This was later in the con. We'll explain that story later, but we'll go ahead and show the photo now. Hey, Sophie so Aldrin. She's another amazing person, too. Sean's going to take a picture of all these. So that yes. I will take pictures of all these. <laughs> and most of the Torchwood cast. Ooh, everybody Sanzianto. Well, he's dead, so he couldn't come. <laughs> <laughs> I like how uh, Gwen put a halo on herself. And oh, the man or the story. There's a story, there's a story on that, too, because, yeah... And I, it didn't catch it until because I seen her doing it. She is, she is awesome. She is very um, outspoken, energetic, and just so fun to talk to. We're sitting there talking to her, and she's signing the autograph, and she does a circle, a halo around her head, and we're like, okay, you know, I didn't think anything about it. And then we went and got Tosh, and I can never say her name correctly, and I felt Nako Mori. Nako Mori. We went to get her autograph, and she's she's very pleasant to talk to, too. And I'm like, Yee! you know, trying not to squeam. And she puts horns on her head, and I'm like, am I missing something here? <laughs> so we got this awesome autograph of all these um, guys on there, and then we go to the panel. And we're like, oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, uh, Eve is... Uh, Quite the prankster. <laughs> very, very much in the same temperament of John Barrowman. John Barrowman. And huh. those two would play on. And that's something that we can, we'll talk about. So th- this is apparently her response to the panel where she's like, I'm really not such a bad girl. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and Tosh going, ha, 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 yeah, look at this. To herself, which I thought was funny. <laughs> then at 6.30 the night, we went to a classic companions uh, panel. That had uh, Sophie Alfred, Caroline Ford, Janet Fielding, Wendy Padbury, Fraser Hines, and it was uh, moderated by uh, Bickerstaff. Bickerstaff, yes. But uh, so it was another classic companion panel, and this time we had Janet in there, and she <laughs> and Sophie. Janet and Sophie. Yes. So we had two more additional uh, classic companions, and once again, hearing these gals and. Well, Fraser, sorry. <laughs> he, he could be one of the gals, too. He wears a skirt, right? <laughs> I really want to tell Fraser's joke. Fraser told a joke during the, the early years panel. And he kept it PG, but it's still kind of a dirty joke. I don't know if I can tell it or not. It, it's, it's PG enough. I think, you know. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to tell this. So, uh, if not, Glenn will be... Yeah, Glenn, Glenn, will, Glenn will horn me if not. So this is Fraser Hines telling the joke. And there, there was the question of something about memorable things that happened on the set of one. Oh, he was asked what it was, is when, with your doctor, can you name one specific moment that sticks out in your mind the That's most? That's what it was. 
So during the making of Enemy of the World, and he says, I'm being yelled at by the director. Frazier, come close to the desk. Frazier, come close to us. Patrick, you stay where you're at. We want to see you in the background. Frazier, come close to the desk. Frazier, or no, it wasn't the invasion. It was the invasion. The invasion. Come close to the desk. Come close to the desk. Can you get any close to the desk? And, Pat, and, and Frazier Hines says, no, I can't get any closer to my desk. Or to the desk, my wedding tackle is touching it <laughs> because he's in the kilt. And from the back of the room, Patrick Troughton says, "So is mine." <laughs> <laughs> he says, "Forever and on, I will remember him making that comment." <laughs> now, funny joke in and of itself, but we've talked before about how an awesome Patrick Troughton that Fraser Hines does. So to see him do it live was just because he did it in Patrick's voice. He did it in Patrick's voice. That that was the. Yep, I'm done. <laughs> I can't get any better than this. So, but yeah, the um, classic companions. The classic panel. companions panel. That's where they talked a lot about. Um, there, there were a lot of little things that apparently they had to fight for their characters for, which kind of surprised me. One of them, uh, Caroline Ford, talked about in the Five Doctors that they were not going to allow her to call him grandfather. That the script was specifically written that she says doctor every single time. And she questioned somebody about it. She, she queried, she says, why isn't he grandfather? I never referred him to grandfather. Why not? And weeks passed and they hemmed and hawed and finally kind of admitted that, well, that means that he would have had to have been married and, and you know. <laughs> well, not necessarily, but... The, and, and at least you know well, there, there, there would have you know. there would have had to have been a child and she goes yeah <laughs> <laughs> and and apparently the BBC at the time was not prepared to accept that possibility and she put her foot down and said no <laughs> he's grandfather that's the way this works that's who he is and so they recanted and had to do that I think Janet Fieldings was uh, I can't remember the episode. It was the same thing they, they, in the Five Doctors, where they get back to the TARDIS, and uh, they're having the discussion, and it's something about the two girls are sent to go get refreshments, coffee, and they're supposed to go, go get, get coffee. coffee. She's like, and she no. said no. <laughs> and Janet is uh, very outspoken, and she's uh, she does not take blows. No, she's awesome. <laughs> She's very woman's rights, I'd say that, and and rightly so. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. the, the, the no, joke I mean, about to her, this day, still. I mean, yeah, she's the, very... the joke about her being a mouth with legs is, you know, is certainly true back when the show was on, but it's it's extends to this day, and you know, it was not for the sake of being, you know, militant. Indignant. It was yeah. indignant. Yeah. It was for the sake of being. Why does it have th- to this be? This doesn't have her. to be done yeah. this way. Yeah. yeah. And so it was rewritten to incorporate Turlo and something else with with Stone. And, and she mentioned that on another one that, that you know she was stabbing buttons randomly on the TARDIS, and she's like, "Why am I the one that's doing this? Why do I have to, you know, why do I have to look dumb?" And so they would they would change things up so that they wouldn't have to. But a, a lot of the writers apparently had that mindset of, "Oh well, you're the companion. You get and on stuck this with panel this. in particular, they all. And what I mean, they all. I meant Wendy." Uh, Wendy, Carol Ann, and Janet were all, and I hope I don't misspeak this, were all envious of Sophie. Yeah. Her character. Cause it's like, because she's such a strong female yeah, character. She like, gets to do those things yeah, that they didn't they get to do. They just kept talking yeah. about and were totally all by, you know, your character got to do, and you, you know, you were able, and they asked her, and I'm going to tell Sophie's um, little tidbit, or little um, story, but they all asked Sophie, and it's like, how... How were you able to do this? Or I did. She goes. I just said, "Here, we're going to do this." And she's like, "I had no problems." They're like, "Yeah." <laughs> and she said, "There was only one instance where, you know, I got." She, she's. There was some episode, and I can't remember. It was what, Dragon Fire. Dragon Fire. One. When she goes to lay back on the bed, and they're like, uh, "Sophie, can can you come off stage? Can you come over here and come over here? We need to talk to you a little bit." And she goes, "What?" She goes. We need to shave your armpits. <laughs> 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 and Janet's like, "Did what was it? Did you have a uh, uh, God? I can think of the actor's name." She said, "Did you have a so and so Julia Roberts Julia moment. Roberts moment?" <laughs> <laughs> she goes, they just they had to they had to shave my armpits. <laughs> 
She said, that's about the extent of, you know, them tell you know, everything else was, you know, sure, well, do it. Jan- Janet in particular, totally in awe of the fact that, that Sophie Aldred apparently got to pick most of her own wardrobe. Yep. That was unheard of in her day. She goes, what did you do to John Nathan Turner to allow that, you know? <laughs> and she said, you just, you know. You really must have softened the butt. She goes, yeah, I used a baseball bat. <laughs> <laughs> The, 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 she said, "Well, maybe, maybe we, he was just so worn down by that point. <laughs> you know, yeah, he didn't care anymore. But yeah, it was. It was it, when you get that kind of dynamic up there to see these different eras, that, that was really interesting to to see that play out. And then I think that was it for Friday. After we seen that panel, um, it was pretty much <laughs> we're tired. Uh, Saturday we started out with." Uh, Mitch's panel, um, the Gallifrey Gender Bend, which was um, really about gender, not not necessarily equality, but it was uh, more along the lines of kind of the the centralized question that's been kind of cropping up over and over and over again: is is can the doctor become a woman in his next generation? Should he? Is it time? Is it right? Is, is it why not? You know, and all this kind of stuff. And uh, the, the the panelists were for the most part. I think very favorable and pro to the idea. Well, um, and what I liked about it was the guy that was on the panel that wasn't necessarily con. He came out and it was awesome. Him says he goes, "I'm not here, you know. I'm here for you to to convince me that this is why it needs to happen, not the other way around." Which I thought was really, you know, adult or whatever you want to call it of him to say. Very that, mature. Very yeah. mature of him to say that. He, yeah, I'm not against it. I'm just here for you to convince me. That this is the way it should be. And he definitely was not a fan of the idea, but he wasn't completely he opposed wasn't to it. He was, it yeah. he, he was It's good. probably more of a, I don't see a reason to, so that's tell maybe me why good, yeah. there's a reason to do it at this point. That's maybe a good reason. And, and that's where, and that ties in with the audience, too, that um, a lot of their questions were, is this the right time for it to happen? Not necessarily that we don't want it to happen, but is this the time for it to happen? And a lot of people, which is a valid question, yeah. ask, which, which, which kind of surprised me, but I guess maybe not, because we've talked about this before on the show too, where a lot of the people, one of the one of the panelists in particular, mentioned, "Do we really want a female doctor now?" While Stephen Moffat is still in charge writing the show, yeah, and she kind of pointed out that his female characters are blah blah blah, you know, as as we've you know mentioned before. And one of the other panelists pointed out, I was like, well, we've had, you know, attempts at it, and they've done this, and they've done this, and, well, there was Curse of the Red Death with Joanna Lumley. And I felt compelled to shout out, which was written by Stephen <laughs> Moffat before anybody wants to go on this witch hunt again. Yeah. Um, but it was, it was a, a... It was a... It wasn't heated, but it was definitely live um, commentary back and forth between the audience and the panel. It was spirited. It was a very good panel. Very good. Yeah. So, let's see... And then <laughs> that's when, after that, Mitch discovered... Well, actually, it was at breakfast that Mitch discovered that she had misplaced some of the artwork that she had bought. Oh. So <laughs> she was... I'm surprised that she could concentrate on the panel because she was worried about the artwork that she bought. And the dealer's room doesn't open up until 11. Her panel is at 10. So... <laughs> so I sit through the whole thing. Yeah. So we... Uh, she She's quick. Man. She took off. <laughs> it's like, where'd Mitch go? I don't know. Well, we know she's looking for her artwork, so we went into the dealer's room to try to help her. And we finally ran into her later, and she did end up finding it. So That's good. Yeah. So um, we were going to try to see the next panel of Doctor Who Am I. Didn't work out so well. Uh, Saturday was, uh, the, the, the Galley's all about programming. That's what their their big push is. That's what they're known for is go, go to Galley, go to panels. And we had a full day of, of programming lined up for Saturday. Unfortunately, the full day of Saturday programming all wound up to be during the exact same block. Yep. <laughs> it was all across the board at the same time because of the rescheduling. And ah. um, we missed Doctor Who Am I, which mm-hmm. was a, a presentation put on by Matthew, Matthew Jacobs. Jacobs, who is the writer of the TV movie. And he is working on a documentary called Doctor Who Am I, uh, which basically kind of tells fans' experiences within Doctor Who fandom. And this is his first convention ever. This is the first thing he's ever attended. So he had a funny wow. crew kind of following him around, kind of it was really a doing these experiences. And yeah, he was <laughs> a little shell-shocked, I think, to kind of 
kind of see some of this. We we did get to briefly touch base with him uh, and, and talk to him for just a minute, but um, we, we unfortunately missed the panel, which uh, I understand would have been sounded really really cool. And Daphne Ashbrook showed up to help um, with that, so um, we're hoping to hear some more uh, from him um, later in in the, in the next coming weeks or so, and hopefully we'll be able to impart some more details about this project. Uh, to our listeners, because it's something I'm very excited about. I don't know about anybody else, but um, we were very yeah. Uh, I was. It, it, it definitely sounds like a cool idea. So we also were trying to, I don't know, hammer out a, another interview for um, traveling the vortex, which hopefully will air soon. Which one? I can't read your handwriting. <laughs> <laughs> Because I remember we had an interview that day, but I can't remember who, because that's why we missed the panel. Who did we interview? What was the first one I sent to you? Cardinal. Oh! No, it wasn't that one. Legacy. Yeah, because we had to be there. It was Legacy. Legacy. It was before, yeah. See, I, can't, I couldn't remember who it was. Because we were interviewing um, uh, Lee and Susan, we missed out on the Timey Wimey Puppet Show. Uh, and the introduction of the new show. I but gallop. Mike's going to be. At but Mike's going to. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, he'll be so friend of the show, Mike. I'm. 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 And, and we've already told um, our, our Planet Comic Con handlers that we need to be off for the puppet show. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. So uh, this is us talking to uh, 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 Lee and Susan Cummings from uh, Tiny Rebel Games at uh, Galley about Doctor Who Legacy. I'm Susan Cummings. I'm the executive producer of Doctor Who Legacy. And I'm Lee Cummings. I'm the creative director of Doctor Who Legacy. Well, first of all, thank you very much for agreeing to do this. We're oh, welcome. Thank you. My pleasure. Had some miscommunications and uh, ah. opportunities. We just not, bad timing, I think, all the way around. No worries. You guys are coming off a pretty phenomenal year for the launch of this thing. It's, it's, it's been a it's long, been pretty crazy wild, year. hasn't it? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I mean, considering where we started with uh, when we got to talk to you last year at Galley, yes. just after the launch, and where we're at now with just coming off of season eight and the yep. advent calendar and all of the material that you guys pumped out. How are you still standing? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> we don't sleep very lots much. Lots of whiskey. Yes, lots of whiskey. <laughs> I mean, with, with BBC being in London and our tech team uh, and our team being in Taiwan, it, we're kind of always up. Yeah, we don't really sleep. The earlier I can get up, the better for London, and the later I can stay awake, the better for Taiwan. <laughs> <laughs> we nap at lunchtime And then there's the six-year-old. Uh-huh. Then you have a child on top of that, that yeah. Um, but it's fun, you know. We, we've been making games for almost 20 years now. and uh, Sorry, sorry. For almost 20 years now. And this is the most fun we've really ever had supporting a game. I mean, we've never really been this close to the people who play our game. Oh, like, no, it's been amazing. And, you know, it, it's, it is a lot of work, but it's also a huge weight is carried by BBC. Yeah. Peter is like a genie. We just go, we need so-and-so from the show. And, and then, then suddenly we have the happens. rights. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Seed is amazing we, and they, you know we say we're doing this and they come back with the tech or the art that we need and they're yeah. just superb everyone else does the hard work we just, yeah. just kind of come correct. with crazy ideas yeah. and, and talk I heard a pretty amazing story at I believe it was at Chicago TARDIS that somebody had apparently told um, uh, oh Mickey what's his name Noel Clark no yes. yes that apparently someone came by who was there no, and he had said no yes it, and immediately was, texted to get it rectified yeah there was a miscommunication he, he did sign off a long time ago um, we just hadn't gotten to that part of the of the of the show yet we hadn't gotten back into that season and uh, so somebody in the audience said why didn't you sign up and he was just like what do you mean I didn't sign up and he it was really awesome and he emailed his agent we already had him but then we because of that accelerated it we and gave put him, him in, like, straight away in yeah. the advent calendar yeah. yeah so um and we're hoping to get him on to twitch to talk about it actually sometimes that'd be great yeah 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 we love nikki we uh we, we've gone through of course we continue to talk about legacy it's continued to be an obsession for the three of us on the oh, podcast thank you uh to the point where we've had uh one of our listeners dan wrote in and said yeah i tried it and i didn't really get into it and we kind of all went what and <laughs> berated awesome. him for a good half hour on the show <laughs> he wrote back uh, I think it was probably two weeks later, and he had surpassed me. He's up to 400 stars. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. He can't stop playing it now. He didn't know what it was about it originally, but he's just, he's just devouring it. And everybody that I've talked to has kind of a similar story where they just we can't quite get over the simplicity of the game and yet the amazingly underlying complexity of what's going on and how the, the, the gameplay works yeah. and just the fun level of it that it builds on so many different things. Is that something it, it, it is, yeah. Well, from the beginning, we love RPGs and that was the backbone of the game was, you know, we wanted to create something where, you know, it, 
it was part of Doctor Who that the Doctor goes in with companions and allies and does something great that draws from the strength of all of them, right? It's at sort of the, the backbone of the show. It's, it's a this ensemble cast, and we wanted that in a game where you could bring in your favorite characters from the history of the show, and they all bring something to the table, all bring something different, and you can utilize them in different ways and get through these puzzles uh, using this RPG back, you know, backbone, and that feeds the complexity of the game. You know, these very solid foundations of gameplay mm. let you know, let that grow beautifully. You know, as you add more characters, it just gets beautifully more complex, but still. But still accessible. It's still you can still break the experience down to a level that even non gamers can understand, and that lets them through the door. And then you slowly make it more complex, and you slowly add more characters, and then you get to the point where you add really hard abilities for enemies, and they know because they've they've played forty hours, they understand the beginnings now. Now you can take them to the harder the harder place in the design, you know, where you need specific teams or specific skills to get through an encounter. But it's one of the challenges of the game is the fact that we knew we would have a very broad audience and we didn't want to overwhelm people in the beginning, uh, so we ease people into it. And I think that there are people who look at that and think, oh, this is easy, it's Bejeweled. And in the very early part of the game, you can just make one gem match and treat it like Bejeweled, and you'll be fine and you'll see lots of combos and stuff, and that's a way to get you into it. But for an experienced gamer, they may look at that and be like, that's too easy, I'm going to you know, play Puzzle Dragons or something. And they have to get past that beginner's area to start seeing more of the depth and start collecting characters and stuff. And that's just challenging for, for us from a PR standpoint to make sure people understand that. We also very much appreciate the, uh, the free-to-play nature yeah. of the game and the fact that it's not one of those kind of tricks you into, oh, you can go so far away. Sort of free, yeah. yeah. We, we love the fact that that's sticking around and, have, again, we adamantly we don't quite brow people, uh, browbeat them with it, but you know, go sign up for the fan area, go pay oh, for this. You. This is material you. you need to have. Yeah, it, yeah that, that makes the game grow. It's it's a very easy equation. If if we make something that people love, and they that, that make you know makes them want to put money into the game in some way or support it in other ways and tell friends about it, it brings more money in and we can make more content. And it's just this great cycle. We're hopefully, you know, we're just the gatekeepers of that. We want to make sure that we keep doing things that they want to see. Because if we don't, if we start making missteps. People won't like the game, and it all just stops. So, any we're actually we're going to have a, obviously there's a big legacy panel. That you guys yes. talk for an, a full hour on this here. <laughs> any, any sneak peeks? Of course, by the time we get this edited, it will have already happen. But is there anything you can let us in on that's maybe in the works that's you know coming? Uh, well, the big thing is big, is, 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 is is the pixel who stuff is bigger on the inside. Um, these, which these, is, behind you there, the, old, the amazing art, uh, <laughs> seasons and seasons of characters in beautiful. Bit out. Well, yeah, what's fantastic about it is that, is that Nathan has so much stuff that he's, he's drawn over the years, and so it means that we can quickly start mixing things up a lot in that area, um, because we don't have to, you know, first draw, you know, thousands of characters and stuff to start accomplishing more of the classic. Yeah, to, to, to sort of jump into more, much more classic uh, era stuff. Yeah, so that's a, that's a, that's a fun new thing that we're doing. Um, we're going to be doing more with Titan Comics. Uh, they have the ninth comic book series coming, and so we're going to be doing uh, more tie-ins with that alongside it, like bringing in Chris Eppleson's costume like we did with the 10th letter. So that's coming soon. And, and you know, very soon is the story will start being released weekly. That's our, our big thing we're pushing towards. Is every week, three or four levels will come in and just increase, the, you know, and just push the story forward every week. So you can just, you know, like watching the show every week. It'll be some, you know, some new levels, some new content. If you can just play the game once a week, you know, you can get a good hour of new content continually. Uh, yeah, forever, hopefully. Yeah, and the, and the chapter four, you're going to see a lot more classics. I don't know if you want to mention a few of the episodes that we're starting. To yeah, we're really soon. pushing a lot, a lot further back. Um, we have a big unit section coming, which really dives into the most, you know, the bigger unit stories, going all the way back, all the way back to sort of Re- Web of Fear. Um, it's, it's just Cave, a lot. Of Caves of uh, Andrazani. Andrazani's coming later in the year, yeah. you know, Tenth Planet, going back to some really, really early stuff. Yeah, we just got the Mandash and Cybermen uh, through, which we're really oh. excited. And they'll be in uh, Big on the Inside, in Pixel as well, so we're going to introduce yeah. you in both ears. Well, we were told that that was Peter Capaldi's, like, favorite classic uh, enemy that he really wants to bring back into the show, and we heard that, we are just like, we can do it, we're adding the Mandash and Cybermen. <laughs> <laughs> so we accelerated that as soon as we heard that. So we have loads, starting in, we're just waiting for a new bill to be approved, to be finalized and approved, and then from that point on, we have loads of content coming. We have the next three or four months planned out and approved. ABC's and, and already then talking we, to us about like what we're doing for the next season. For the next season. season. We, we have, we have most of this year written in terms of story, which lands on a massive uh, new enemy, well, not a massive classic enemy who's going to take over the role of the Masters in sort of as the antagonist of the He's story. He's having a hard time letting the Masters go. We, we, keep, we keep weaving the Masters. <laughs> yeah, we keep adding more in. So, so the rest of uh, season four, you'll see more... Masters joining the story it's going to be awesome yeah. and then as we wrap up the Master story is a big entrance of a, of a very awesome classic character yes. I can't say because it'll spoil the next six months of stuff <laughs> but everything from the new level from the first new level is leading 
to this big beat at the end. A uh, big, big change in the story. Yeah. Last question is uh, one of the, uh, the things that we've started. With. Oh, do you have? Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, we'll go for it. <laughs> <laughs> he got me hooked on Legacy. And I'm like, no, I don't want to play it. I don't want to play it. I finally play it. I can't stop playing it. But one thing that frustrates me for someone who doesn't have memory to be able to retain what characters have what abilities, is there any way, shape, or form that we can have the area where you sort the companions? You can sort them not by color, rank, or anything, but by their ability. Yeah, we, I, I want to add, idea. we need to do more, we need more information on that. Especially like when you tap on it, it should tell you what they well, do. One of the things I want to do is combine the team and TARDIS functions, because I don't want, when, when you form your team, you have to go back to the TARDIS to see some of that stuff. And I want to combine all that into one. We'd be planning so. a UI overhaul of the front end, like an extensive Because I'll have an excellent um, team together, and then I'm like, oh, who was that? And no, then I'm like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Like, so there's, the other thing we want to do is we want to uh, give you the ability to save out perks to different teams. So that, that'll, that'll yeah. yes, yes, everybody wants That's that. Um, <laughs> and we are about to add the ability to put uh, costumes on their expert versions so that they can wear the costumes that the regular version of that character has. Very cool. Because we've been asked for that for a while. Well, that'll be coming in the next couple weeks. Okay, now you can answer your question. Okay, so <laughs> one of the things that we've started doing is we do a uh, Doctor Who Legacy tip of the week. Oh, cool. Things that we awesome. start kind of discovering as we go through and things that yeah. we uh, didn't realize that, for example, if you actually, when you target a specific character, the little bouncing arrows, I had no oh, idea yeah. those yes. Oh, until okay. about three weeks ago. You see the arrows and the the more you know. Yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> Give me a tip. What is your guy's tip of the week? <laughs> oh, my God. Tip of the week. I don't know. What tips have you done? <laughs> we what do you know that we did? What the information do we have? <laughs> they don't. We're playing Stump the Creators. <laughs> you know, well, my tip would be to start moving away from monocolored teams a little bit. For people who do play a lot of monocolored teams. Um, I, I think it's a much more fun game if you start mixing that up a little bit and do two or three color teams. And the game design is going to start changing a little bit to stop you from just walking in with a bunch of new guys because it, it's a little bit of a I think it takes the fun out of the game a little bit so we're going to play with that a little bit so maybe it's time to if you are a monocolor player maybe mess around with a few two or three color teams and I'd say another thing is I, I know a lot of people get challenged when they start playing by the fact that um, you have a long time to move your gem it isn't bejeweled you don't just swap it and there's an aha moment where people are like oh I can do lots of things here before I remember watching Adipose's wife Clara tried to play it and I kept trying no 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 but don't drop the gem no don't drop the gem keep moving it and I think one thing that helps people to do that is look at the board find the move that you saw that you want to end with and end with that take the gem move around do everything else and end up in that position of that, that first thing that you started I think it helps then people to think about the board differently it's not just one swap it's, it's, it's making as many combos as you can yeah yeah <laughs> where's that going? I don't know <laughs> the kid just dressed like a turtle. <laughs> there you go. Uh, all right. Well, uh, thank you. Oh, You're thank welcome. You. Thank, thank you. you. Continued support of the game. Thank you for continuing to to make this and make it fun and, and keep it going. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very it's never the same. It's never a dull moment, and that's what I no. love about the game. Never a dull moment. Thank Always you. learning something. <laughs> thank you. And, and, and so, so, so when are we going to get our, our traveling board fix? Candy Man Merca at a level. When's that coming? Oh, Candy. We can't match. Well, the macro. Macro. Am I pronouncing? I've been I mean, I've been asking macro wrong in the office for the last how many months? The, yes, they're coming. Okay. Uh, yes, <laughs> and it's going to be awesome. And there's a whole arc written for them. It's it's actually the, the season four levels are starting now, and then for about three months is the first arc of story that I've had approved, and we'll release the first three months, and then I've got the second arc that's just waiting for approval. And in there, in the beginning of that second arc, is a lot of giant crustacean fun ah. and it's awesome I love it it's a great little story in there in the middle of there someone new comes in and you find these giant yeah it's going to be awesome I hope you, I hope you enjoy it there you go some insight on uh, what to expect and what's to come <laughs> macro <laughs> <laughs> macro unfortunately yeah. I think you were kind enough not to correct him by saying um, I said Merka <laughs> he was so excited <laughs> Sev they, several stages <laughs> of macro coming. Oh, well, yeah, say, I, I could see, I could just hear it in Lee's voice uh, <laughs> that he was very excited that they have lots of yes. macro coming in the next, <laughs> coming like, very soon. And you guys were just polite enough to say, 
Okay. Yeah, well, that's and it. I was just so really shell shocked too. It wasn't it crabs that show up? And not the <laughs> that's, what he, that's what he thought. He said, "So we'll have the crustaceans. You know, lots of crustaceans." <laughs> was like, um, Merca, not my, not macro. But I'm excited to see. I'm, I'm excited I am, for I am, I am still super stoked. For super stoked for crabs. Yes, <laughs> yes. Just giant crabs. Yes, Even though we still have never seen Terror the Macra <laughs> because it doesn't it doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. And they've never recovered. It's in recons. However, they did luckily return in uh, the what is the gridlock. city one? Gridlock. gridlock. Yeah, you so. got to see the claws. Did the claws? I saw them reaching for the cars. <laughs> I think we need to do a fan edit of Gridlock so that when we get that shot. We can pipe in, mine, mine, mine. <laughs> they, I think that would go well. So that's exciting news. That yeah, Mac- it was a pleasure talking to them. And a- after we... And well, and as you noticed, um, Sean asked Lee and Susan to give their tip of the week. So yep. there is the... Uh, there's straight from the developers right there. Straight from the game makers. That's their Doctor Who... Tip of the, the week. <laughs> <laughs> So after, after how many? That's going to be the contest for this week. Is how many? <laughs> how many we <laughs> we'll make it simpler. But um, so we interviewed them and before they uh, did their panel, and so we went directly from interviewing them to sitting on the panel. <laughs> so <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> you get to talk more legacy. There, 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 were, there were certain moments in the panel that I thought <laughs> I already know this. <laughs> <laughs> did you get that? Too? Yes. We're cooler than we everybody like- in the room because <laughs> we already know this part. Um, we, we won't uh, we won't spoil too much of the of the panel. Um, but for those of you that were not able to attend, um, and I don't think Galley's posting anything. Um, certainly not in its entirety or anything um, from 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 this year. Uh, but one of the things that was talked about is the uh, tie-in with the uh, Pixel Who art. That um, they, because they have, the Pixel Who folk have so much of the artwork already done. And I guess what it is, that, yeah. the, the, and I didn't quite it's understand. It's called Bigger on the Inside. Bigger on the Inside. Bigger on the Inside, 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 inside yeah. I guess I didn't quite understand how the, big, uh, the Pixel Who art works. Basically, what these guys are doing is he's going through every episode of Doctor Who. Every character in every episode is getting a pixelated art form. That is his project. She said, even if a cat walks across the screen, that cat gets pixelated. (laughs) (laughs) So um, he's done all the First Doctor, third, fourth, and... Yeah. Fifth? Uh, I think fifth. No, he's working on fifth. Working on five. That's what she says uh, because it gives him a a good excuse to go back and watch it all. (laughs) And And she is part of the project as well. You well, keep well his, his wife. Um, his but wife. I cannot yeah. I, for I think, life me I cannot remember their names. I feel right. so bad. I, and I I we do have a Carter somewhere from them, but I'm assuming and this is could be wrong of me that it's another uh husband wife team. Yeah, she so, handles I think all of the uh Yeah. um the contracts, the court, you know, the you know, working the details out and such and the he business the business, business end of it. Well, there you go. And he does the all manager, the work. Yeah. So to speak. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. yeah. There you go. But, but yeah, um, they were very pleasant and very open and excited and enthusiastic about being so welcomed into the Doctor Who community. So that's one thing that, you know, she just and he was he just shined so bright. He was so, you know, glowing with pride and <laughs> except, you know, being accepted by everybody. It was just it was so cool. I use that word a lot. Cool. But it was so cool to see him sit up there and shine with pride with. The work that he's done, but also with uh, being up there, and they both back and forth, Susan and Lee, and them just complimented each other on how well it is and how awesome it is to work with each other. So, but because of the huge backlog of work that he's got already done, that kind of is what spawned the story arc for this next thrust of Doctor Who Legacy, called Bigger on the Inside, where something happens to the TARDIS um, dimensional circuit, and everything gets flattened into this pixelated art form. So that enabled them to kind of write a whole arc and use the artwork that's already done so that they can just uh, get approval for it as opposed to going and creating new art for all this kind of stuff. So they can throw a lot of new characters into the game right away. And here's this, 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 this. Yes. Later. 
And so that that's kind of what's coming. And and I like the fact that they it's not just the gimmick of which I think we kind of got in the advent calendars. It kind of felt like a gimmick. I'm so like, oh, here's a character a, costume yeah. of this pixelated art. But now it's like, oh, it's an actual plot thread that this is going into the game, which I think is kind of cool. Um, that you know they'll be moving around in a two dimensional space yeah. as these pixelated characters, which is kind of cool. But then once you know, then they they've gotten that. So Nathan is his name. Nathan, okay. thank you. <clears throat> Um, but, uh, of course, since the BBC has approved the pixelated art, the real artwork will be coming down the pipeline as well later, yeah. um, for all these new characters, but it's going to be a lot of, it sounds like, uh, a lot of unit and a lot of, um, um, who, who was the other one? I don't remember now the different errors, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff coming on the, on, on that front. For and the, one thing for the I wanted to share in, cause <laughs> The Nathan made the comment that he said, um, going through all these pictures, because a lot of these um, classic episodes, um, he's had to pull the images from still photos or promotional shots, mm-hmm. whatever this. He said, go back and look at classic who, you know, something that you don't see a lot of people's feet. They have no feet. <laughs> you don't know what shoes to put them in or what their shoes look like. He goes, you know how hard that is? So that was his comment about trying to go back and pixelate some of the characters that he didn't know what their feet looked like. <laughs> just, because of the, just because of the way the episodes were it's shot. Everybody shot from waist up. From waist up. So I and thought it, that was an interesting fact listening to him going back and doing his work. And until he said that, I had to go back and my mental filing cabinet flew up and I went, yeah, you're right. <laughs> For all the running they did, we didn't see much feet. Nope. So that kind of wrapped up uh, Saturday. We well, and the other thing that Legacy, real quick, that they, oh. they talked about with season four, or chapter four, chapter four whatever it's named now, um, the big change, they're, they're working on a change to the OS that's going to c- kind of reformat the structure part of the, the interface, but uh, season four is not going to be delivered in one chunk. It's going to be coming out, you'll get a couple of uh, uh, chapters each week. Every other week, somewhere, somewhere in there, yep. it's going to be a more constant stream of new content coming out. More like they did with uh, Series Eight. Yeah, and and, yeah. and and so there's that. They also uh, uh, snuck in a little piece of because apparently everybody keeps asking about Donna Noble. When's Donna <laughs> Noble going to come up? And they, 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 on. they are working on it. Um, and apparently they uh, they clarified the Mickey situation. That uh, it wasn't so much that uh, you know there was miscommunication or anything that he had given his approval and they had it. They just didn't have a spot in the story for him to come in yet. That it was planned for for much later down the road. They talked a little bit about that in the interview there too. Did they did one? Yeah. one oh, okay. I thought it was just on the on the other. But uh, so then you know when when he sent the why am I not in the game yet? They felt obligated to put him in. It's like okay, <laughs> let's get him in so they don't. They I do that. know that in the panel they mentioned that there is one person that has turned them down. I was just getting ready to say that, that they one have, person. They have all the doctors have signed off on saying yes, they'll do it. And he says, well, and Susan says, well, as a matter of fact, that there's only one person that has turned them down at the request to be, you know, put in the game. And um, Lee says, now he had he had very legitimate, good, valid reasons, reasons yeah. for why he didn't want to. And someone comes in the audience, Richard Grant, or, you know, says, says Grant, you know. Who? Richard E. Grant. Oh, Richard E. Grant. Yeah. We, we don't know this. We, we don't they, know they, this. They, they, they are That's protecting the, the, the person yeah. of this of this film. In a way, it makes sense in my mind to say Richard E. Grant because we've gotten the great intelligence, in the, we not but we've not gotten Dr. Simeon. Dr. Simeon. Dr. Simeon. Yeah. And so anytime we see the great intelligence, it's the pyramid. pyramid. And it's like, okay, so in a way, that's kind of a giveaway. You mentioned... Uh, Eric Roberts. That's what <laughs> I kind of thought they, you were going to. At some point, didn't they say that they were working on all of the masters? And then and, and somebody... They I think, said they had all of the masters yeah. sign off on it, so... Yeah. So it, it must not be her. Uh, it, you know, so although we haven't seen his He'll give his game. image to a game, but he won't give a bumper to <laughs> yeah. uh, not without He's some still money. Rizzy. <laughs> Oh yeah, well, not without that, that, well, that, that'll yeah. be the condition. He can only be in the game if he's drezzed for the occasion. <laughs> right. um, so yeah. Well, isn't he in the artwork for chapter three? Like or that for chapter I think four? He the is, collage actually. of all yeah, the masters. Now, now that you say that, that, I think he is. Now that you say that. I just correct. unlocked it, so I don't know. <laughs> I haven't actually looked at it. I don't know. It yet. Uh, Slightly uh, dark. Chapter for four me. is what you just unlocked. J- James speculated that it might be the actor who played Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> Because why would you want your image forever associated yeah. with that? I mean, uh, come on. So. 
So, yeah. But yeah, a lot of rampant speculation trying to figure out who this one they person They wouldn't was. say. They said that's not fair or kind of them to, you know, say yeah. who. Yeah, uh, it's but, understandable. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Certainly but, understandable. But, yeah, so, you know, so be it. I think they also said that BBC's been really accommodating with pretty much anything, oh, yeah. you know, that the, the Lee sits there and comes up with the concept and says, I need this. And then Susan calls somebody and they go off and make it happen and they come back and say, okay, you've got this. <laughs> so here it is. And I don't know if they said this in the interview or it was on the panel. I think it was on the panel to where... They're going to try to do with this, uh, when it starts back up again, the same thing that they did um, last time. Release a new level every day oh. that, and Lee's like... Same thing with Series yes, 9 that they did with Series we 9. are. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I'm looking forward to it. Oh, I gotta take... Okay, so, the robots of Sherwood level. Oh, yeah. For the record, uh, Eric Roberts is not on there. He's uh, not on that. No. Okay, well then that I mystery is still deep. Emotional art, though. So, um, but the, the the robots of Sherwood um, level that he said the the editing because what happens is they they the BBC you know gets them the stuff and they get just a little bit of lead time on it so they can construct a level around it and then they send it off for approval and they get approval and then they send it off to the guys that do the programming and everything gets up. And then 48 hours before that episode set to air, the beheading thing happens, and so they pulled the plug and said this. Well, apparently, the way that level was originally supposed to work <laughs> is as you fought your way up and then you got to the sheriff, the very last stage was the sheriff with no head, and his head <laughs> was on the, the floor shouting <laughs> insults at you. And, and as you, you had continue to, fight to the play, head. and you had to fight, and and Lee was just beside himself. He was this hysterical. Is, this he is said, so it's great. It's hysterical. funny. It's going to be awesome. And then they had to take the whole thing out because the BBC said, "No, you can't do that anymore." <laughs> and we asked if the 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 head could be like a special director's cut, you know, something or like that. And he said, "No, they'll, they'll never let us." Yeah, it's, it's it, so. we'll gone to the, lost in time. <laughs> You'll never see the head. Sure. Oh, and one thing. Uh, uh, Someone asked them about games that they had created in the past before, and one of the games that Susan said we had uh, had their hand in making or creating was War of the Worlds. <laughs> and and he, did you yeah. chime up and say, yes. I've played it! He, <laughs> says, he says, yeah, we did War of the Worlds, nobody played it. And I was like... <laughs> was, like oh, you, you played it? Like, <laughs> yeah, I loved it! It's like you guys are the only two in the world. <laughs> So that we I scored a few brownie points with that. One. <laughs> <laughs> it was a legitimately cool game, but, so, but and, and the audience went, you know, as they were describing it, everybody else was like, "Ooh, like this sounds really good." It's like, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that wrapped up Saturday. Um, I don't think we need anything after after the. We had plans to go to the uh, the, the late night. We weren't going to do the Masquerade this oh, year, but yeah. we were going to do the DJ. There was a DJ doing this big uh, disco thing. And, With and the we, British music. It was all going to be British music. Mm-hmm. And we thought, oh, yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, and Mel uh, passed out. I'll freely admit it was my fault. <laughs> <laughs> I got back to... Because the idea was we were going to go back and take a nap so that we could make it. Because uh, that party would have gone on until 2, 3, 4 o'clock oh, in yeah. the morning. I mean, because it didn't start until after the Masquerade. Ball or the masquerade part, per, you know, part. So I'm like, oh, okay, we're gonna go back and take a nap. Yeah. <laughs> so Apparently, it was you know, <laughs> Mel did not wake up. I woke up briefly at something like midnight or ten till midnight. And I was like, what time is it? She was like, midnight. I was like, well, we missed that boat. Good night. <laughs> Went back to sleep. She she was in a pile of ribbons on the bed. I didn't even get my ribbons put on because I was so tired. These little stickers stuck to her I was face. Not that <laughs> Sorry. Mitch went to the masquerade and then hung out, I think, for some of it. But that was... Uh... Yeah, I told her, I says, don't, you know, we're old. Don't, don't, you know, party poop on our behalf. Go over there and have fun. You know, mingle. So she went over there and I don't even remember her coming back to the room. I was so tired. <laughs> <laughs> so Sunday morning, we uh, got up. To, we were supposed to have done the John Barlow panel at 10 a.m., but because of Alex Kingston... Um, canceling or not being able to make it, they bumped his panel from 10 to 11, allowing us to sleep in a little bit longer. Uh, noon. Uh, yeah. It was noon. Noon? Yeah. Yeah, I guess yeah, he went all the way to noon. noon. Yeah. But we went, uh, that's right, he went from 10 to noon, and at 11 they were reviewing the Mummy, um, it's Mummy on the Orient Express live commentary, which... Uh, mm. Had Mitch go and secure us room seats. She's awesome at getting good seats. 
She, see, if you need good seats, send Mish, because she gets really good <laughs> seats. She's so tiny. She can just get right in there. But, yeah, she secured us uh, good seats because we were still trying to hook up or meet up with Matthew Jacobs because we had track him down. missed him. That's what it was. I had, I was so enthralled with the legacy panel, I totally forgot that I was supposed to go meet Matthew Jacobs mm-hmm. and arrange a time and... I just got so wound up in the panel, I forgot about it. So we were going to try to meet up with him Sunday morning because he said that he was going to be there Sunday morning and that would be the best time to try to meet up with him. So we were trying to hook up with him, and I asked Mitch to go secure us seats for this uh, um, Mummy on the Inner Express because then it was going to be the Barman panel, which we walked by his panel Saturday there was no standing room. <laughs> they were falling out of the program room, which, yeah, was massive. And from the laughter coming from within, you knew this was going to be a, yeah, we need to make sure that we're there. Early. Yes. <laughs> because they, they, they claim that the both days are going to be repeated programming, and so you just pick one that yeah. you can go to. Yeah. No. no. Yeah, everybody <laughs> went to day one. Well, and I think everybody, I don't know if they went, because it was definitely Because it was definitely not a repeat with John Barlman. Nothing's a repeat with him. Uh, so Mitch has carried us uh, seats, and I was interested in seeing the Mummy uh, Orient Express anyway. But it was live commentary with, uh, let me catch his name. I Matheson. Can't. Matheson, yes. Um, yes. So he was doing the commentary or talking about it, and me being background deaf, it was really hard. Uh, background noise. I have a hard time picking up anybody who's talking if there's other noise going on. Not to mention the fact that you're watching an awesome episode. <laughs> it's kind of hard to pay attention to him, and he was having a hard time, too, because he went, oh, sorry, got to watching again, and he didn't <laughs> forget to comment. It so, was literally like a Friday night who. It was. <laughs> with the writer of the episode, because he'd go quiet for two minutes at a stretch and then go, Oh, wait, sorry. No, I should talk about this part. <laughs> Jamie Matheson's awesome. Uh, he, he told... All of his stories were great talking about this, but he, they, they asked him... Remind the listeners who Jamie Matheson is. Jamie Matheson is the writer of Mummy on the Orient Express uh, and uh, apparently has done some work for uh, the British version of Being Human, which is how he kind of got the thing. And he, uh. he, he, said, he said what's really interesting about it is... He says, I wrote Being Human for four years. I was on that series as a, you know, and sub- submitted for four years of that. And eh, that was kind of the response that you would get. He says, I've done two episodes of Doctor Who, and now the doors are open, <laughs> and people are going, oh, you wrote for Doctor Who, and they're all impressed. And he's like, what parallel universe did I step into? <laughs> he was totally beside himself. Once again, someone being, this his first con, um, being overjoyed at the, the welcoming that he's gotten from Galley, the guest, and everybody. He was just totally overjoyed. With being there. He said he admitted, he, said, he says all these comments, he says everybody keeps complimenting me on how Mummy feels like a classic Who episode. It just feels like genuine Who. And he says, I've never seen one. And everybody went, oh. He goes, I know, right? I says, I, I just, he says, I, it scared me. He says, I saw one Peter Davidson episode back in the day. He says, I don't remember which episode it was, but the monster showed up and I hid behind the couch because it scared me. <laughs> I didn't know what it was, but it was terrifying. But then I knew I wanted to write for this show because it was cool. And uh, so Mummy apparently was kind of a, a, a concept thing that he had submitted enough concept scripts that Stephen Moffat knew he could write. And so Moffat called him <laughs> up and said, okay, so here's the deal. He says, I've got this title. It's Mummy on the Orient Express. Go. But the Orient Express has to be in space. Go. And he said it went through several different script iterations of different concepts with things. And he turned one of them in and they said, like, no, I want it to sounds too much like Matt Smith. He's going to be grumpier in this. And they said, okay. So he changed it up and did something else. Oh, by the way, this is going to be the Clara Light episode. So you have to get her out of it for a while. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. And at one point she was going to be wrapped in bandages and be the mummy. The, the, it was the, the sarcophagus was a conversion machine <laughs> and doing all this kind of stuff. And so they, they kind of kept whittling it down and changing it to get to where it was at. And he says, what was funny is he says, you know, we, we did this, we did this, we did this. And everything was great. And then they realized we can't possibly have all these scientists and actors and people because we can't afford them all. So we have to write all these people out of the show. <laughs> Holograms. Okay. Boom. <laughs> Just, so he says, everything you see in the episode that you think is like, wow, that was a really clever way of doing that. It's like, yeah, it was a necessity. <laughs> we had to change it to make this work. It's like Underworld. I think he said that he based his... Uh 
his writing of this episode on uh, House. Yeah. When, when Moffat kept saying he's going to be grumpy, he's going to be this, and his, his actual description, he says, Moffat says, think of the new Doctor is basically going to be an angry Billy Conley. Yeah. <laughs> and he says, okay. I can't imagine an angry <laughs> Billy Conley, though. It, and that's where you went with it, yeah. But he's, he said, a, he, he, house in the TARDIS. That's what he was going to write. And he says, just when you think you've gotten to that moment where you can't possibly make him this callous, Moffat would come back and say, yeah, go there. <laughs> really? Yeah. Okay. So they would do that. And he said the other thing that the script uh, had to be changed a little bit because of the fallout of um, Kill the Moon. That, you know, initially it was just, we're going on holiday and we're going to have fun in this episode. And then I had to take Clara out. So it was just the doctor doing things. And then I had to do, and then, oh, by the way, there's this emotional baggage from this part that has to be put in. Okay. So you had to keep changing things, which was great. He confirmed that Capaldi's. Capaldi apparently came to the set with this idea in his head of doing this bit of business with a cigar case. Ran it past the director, didn't explain what he was going to do. Or cigarette case. Uh, Explained it to the director, but didn't explain what he was going to do. Just that he was going to do this bit of business. And they said, okay. All of that was him. Opens it up, the jelly baby. And Matheson's like, I love this actor. Because the professor goes, well, yes, I've never seen one of these before, but I will take one and put it in my mouth and eat it. (laughs) Just right off the bat. Sure. He just ran with it and he didn't argue. He's like, okay. You know. He says, I get all this credit for it. He says, not me. It's all Capaldi. (laughs) It's all him. And they asked, did you get to visit the set? And he says, I did. And he says, I picked a really good day to do it because I went... On a day when they were, because this was the Clarolite episode, while they were also filming at the same time, was Flatline, which is the Doctor Light episode, which was also written by Jamie <laughs> Matheson. So he says, I show up and they're doing things over here, and he's like, Well, I'm going to go next door on the other set and see how my other episode is going. <laughs> 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 you know? And he would float back and forth. And he said that um, this is how dedicated Peter is about his role as the Doctor. He was on set that day, um, Flatline. Um, he was off that day, but he was on set the entire day just to be there to see how it was done or if there was anything he could do just to be a part of the show That's on his cool. day off. That's, That's really cool. So that was how dedicated Peter is, and he's just, you know, going back and forth. Yay! <laughs> you know. <laughs> the other bit that I thought was really cool, the image where they open the TARDIS doors and you see Capaldi's oh, yeah. face with the, the ship behind him, not green screen. They built a oh, facade hey, and glued a TARDIS, TARDIS to the front of it so that's that they cool. could and then shoot into the real set. So that's anytime that's that like, they had to shoot that, they had to lift cool. the entire wall up. <laughs> okay, shoot. <laughs> okay, shoot. <laughs> it goes, but it made for awesome, you know, for an awesome shot. So yeah, and that's one of one of the ribbons that was at the uh, uh, lobby con or at the con is really cool and we should take a picture of a post it was is a hand coming out of the TARDIS and it looks like the monsters or whatever the you know the Ood. Adam's family. The Adam's family. Adam's family. Adam's family. Yeah. <laughs> but he was he was a hoot. He was he was a joy to listen to and a lot of fun and uh I I am firm in my fandom of let's get Jamie Matheson back, you know, in any way, shape or form. And they asked him point blank, are you coming back? And and all he could say was Which we took to be a resounding yes. yes. Sure, he's coming back. He's just not allowed to talk about it yet. So that awesome panel led into John Barman. Okay. (laughs) So best. Wait, 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 wait. Tell us what we're going to miss at Kansas City. Part of, you know, exchanging ribbons with uh, new fans and, you know, being out there exchanging ribbons, I ran across this lady who recognized me, but I'm sorry I didn't recognize her. But she goes, have you been to the John Barrowman pan- panel? John Barrowman panel yet? And I said, no. Barrow. Barrowman. Barrowman. Like Will Barrow. Barrow, yeah. I'm too excited, I can't talk. But I said, no. She goes, be prepared. He's that was Ron- for Brenda, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> she says, be prepared. He's raunchy. I was like, all right. <laughs> you know, I was like, lay on. So... We were warning other people, especially Sadie and Cindy, who, you know, we had met last year at uh, Galley, you know, warning anybody. Because, you know, we, we don't want people to be shocked with what they're going into. Even though it may not offend us, it might offend somebody else. Barman, right off the bat, he's like, be prepared. I'm out there, you know. And he was. It was an awesome. You know how Sylvester McCoy is, is kind of like a, a, a wind-up puppy? 
that you just turn him loose and he goes off and does his thing. Barman's kind of the wind-up puppy on crack. Barman. Barman. <laughs> Captain Jack's kind of the wind-up puppy <laughs> yeah, on crack. I like that. See, I love Captain Jack. But he... He bounced he, all over that Remember what Sean He never came saying, down in the audience, no. but which I, probably for his own health, I think might have yeah, been the smart move. He would have gotten... <laughs> he would have been mugged. He would have been mugged, definitely. But he, he was very, very energetic. He is just up, going upbeat, constantly moving, constantly talking, thinking, just on the go, John. Just, yeah, wow. Scott's got his hands full. <laughs> 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 very. He, uh, he goes... I know this is supposed to be a repeat of, you know, yesterday's performance. Not going to happen. He says, this is brand new show. He says, we're going to do it totally different. I talk all the time, and he does. We're going to have you guys ask questions because I feed off you. I'm here for you, so you ask the questions and I'll answer it. Didn't quite work that way. He tried. <laughs> he, re- he really did try. <laughs> But he's such an awesome storyteller. He tangents more than we do. Yeah. And and I tweeted out, as a matter of fact, that John, Captain Jack, and Traveling the Vortex have tangents in common. Because this man does tangent. (laughs) (laughs) But his stories are awesome. And someone asked a question, and I can't remember what uh, what the question was. But he says, um, there are kids up here. He goes, fair warning. He says, you know, if you don't know how I am... Sorry. <laughs> he apologizes right off the bat. He says, I don't hide anything. I don't hold anything back. He goes, whose kids are these up here? And no one would claim the kids. He goes, no one's going to claim these kids? And he leans down and looks at the kids. He goes, would you like to come live with Uncle John? <laughs> <laughs> we have a TARDIS. <laughs> we, <laughs> we have a pool. But, yeah, he was awesome. And then at uh, at one point in the conversation when someone had asked a specific question, and then it did, got a little raunchy, he looks over at the kids and he says, cover your ears. Cover <laughs> them now. <laughs> so, but, yeah. All right. So that's the kid one. Oh, my favorite is honestly the one he told about Scott. Apparently Scott's <laughs> gone on. Because you know, if you follow him on Twitter, you get this Everything. nonstop barrage of the two of them, which is great. They're the cutest couple in the world. He says, Scott apparently has gotten his pilot's license. I let him. He says, I let Scott he get, says, his I let him get his pilot's license. He says, there's no traffic up there, thank God. Because he's up there. I get, he says, I get this phone call. Hi, it's me. He goes, you're flying the airplane. What are you doing? He goes, oh, I wanted to call you and say what's going on. You're flying a plane. Put the phone down. He's screaming at him. It's a thing. He says, you, sh- you should. I wish you were here. It's like the 4th of July. He goes, what? He goes, the fireworks. fireworks. You should see the, the fireworks. Fire. You should see these fireworks. He goes, where are you flying? That there's fireworks. <laughs> There's genuine concern at this point. He goes, it's all the meth labs blowing up up here in the house. <laughs> and he's, Put the phone he's up. He's screaming, hang up the phone, hang up the phone. He goes, okay, I'll take pictures. <laughs> <laughs> and my first thought before he started this story was, poor Scott. He had to have known what he was getting into. He had to oh, know yeah. that, because they've been together forever, but he had to know that when you, when you go in to marry somebody, that this is what you get. That this is the guy he's going to be taking selfies on empty airplanes and, and, and dancing with people at all hours of the night. You have to be prepared for that. But then hearing this is just like, nah. <laughs> <laughs> Perfectly matched. You deserve yeah. each other so much. But he goes on to tell, and one thing that we wanted to talk about, or I, at least I did, was John, someone asked a question um, as far as which did he like playing better? Oh. Captain yeah. Jack, Doctor on Doctor Who, or Captain Jack Torchwood. He goes, I'm going to say both. I can't choose. He says, because there's good and bad to both sides of it. Mm. Doctor Who, he goes, I get to be the ever-loving, open, crazy, you know, character. He says, but on Torchwood, I feel like I'm the more serious, taking on the reins of what the Doctor was, or started, or did, So I have to be more serious on Torchwood. He says, and you can't have one without the other. He says, I love playing both characters. And if I were ever asked to come back and play, yes. There's no doubt in my mind that I would ask. I'd come back in a heartbeat. Ah, Two heartbeats. (laughs) (laughs) But we thought thought of you, Glenn, when he he said that specifically. Because he said that the, the Captain Jack on Torchwood is taking the lessons he learned with as his time with the Doctor and trying to apply them to himself 
in order to keep the team safe. And that's made him a harder character. And I thought, you know what? That's that's a really good just because we talked a lot about sure, th- that that sure, difference yeah. and trying to figure out what that was. And that was what kind of crystallizes like, yeah, that is it. That he's he's trying to be the Doctor when because he pointed out that if it was on Doctor Who and it was you know they, they talked about the Children of Earth episode and that you know he says my his favorite reaction is people come up to me all the time. <laughs> and he's, you know, I hate you. You let your grandchild die. How could you? I hate you, but I love you. And Goodbye. then they run off. <laughs> and he says that to me was the biggest compliment I can get as an actor because I must have done something sure, right. Sure. He says, but on Doctor Who, he says that would have been, you know, sacrifice me because I can come back from that. And you know, the, the, in a heartbeat, he would have done that. He would have done that. But in, in in Torchwood, he has to make that hard decision. And he told a great story about the actor. And he says the the, the kid who played his grandson came to him and says, "Is there anything I can do to really make this you know work?" And he goes, "Oh, I love you. Okay, here's what I want you to do. Look at me. Look at me. Don't stop looking at me. And then I'll give you a little signal." And when I give that, I want you to start convulsing and shaking and just lose Vibrating it. just nonstop. So he it's says, okay. And they do the camera thing, and the kid's staring at him, and he gives him the thing, and the kid starts shaking and vibrating and just really going into this, you know, seizure moment. And apparently he bit his lip, and blood started trickling out of his mouth. And, he, and <laughs> Barrowman was like, you are the greatest actor in the history of <laughs> ever. <laughs> That print. Yes. It was, you know, he was real excited. About it. <laughs> but he was, he was, he was um, a legitimate. He's definitely hoot. entertainer. He is, you know, but he said, he goes, "I'm here for you, and I wouldn't be here if it weren't for you." At the end of the show, he goes, "I'm going to collect as many ribbons as I can." So Sean and I took to collecting some for him, and when we got his autograph, we're like, "Look what we got for you!" <laughs> but uh, he said that he was going to auction them off auction the ribbons off and then give the money to charity. So. Oh, that's oh. cool. Yeah, nice. So, everybody was like, <laughs> and I think at the end of the show, there's pictures of him holding his uh, banner of ribbons that he had. And it was, uh, what was that Courtney's name? It was a Courtney. Um, um, I was looking, Ellis George. Ellis George. Uh, I'm not going to let him beat me. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so it, came, it became quite the competition between those two as to who was going to have the more ribbons. Courtney was a who, too. She She's very much like she is on the show. That's she's pretty much awesome. what, what she sees, what you get. And they, somebody asked her about what's, you know, you know, most difficult thing or uh, shooting. And she's like, the fact that, you know, I had to talk all my friends into believing that I was actually in this episode. And they're like, you're not, <laughs> you're not on Doctor Who. Yeah, I am. I'm on Doctor Who. Watch, I'm going to say something here in a minute. Here I come. <laughs> <laughs> So from uh, Barrowman, um, Barrowman, Barrowman, <laughs> Captain Jack, I agree with Sean. <laughs> um, we didn't get to see uh, Eve Miles and uh, with the Torchwood group like we had hoped to because um, we had another interview, and uh, that was uh, that was Mr. Andrew Cartmel Ooh. that yep. we went to interview, script editor for uh, uh, the Sylvester McC- the entirety of the Sylvester McCoy run. Should we let uh, Andrew ta- tell us? Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll let Andrew tell the story. We have another clip. I'm Andrew Carmel. I was the script editor on Doctor Who for the entire Sylvester McCoy era, so that was three seasons. Seasons 24, 25, and 26. I, I had to think about that. <laughs> <laughs> in your position as script editor, obviously you came in at a interesting transition period. Well, you're being polite because what had happened is the show was it's very controversial. Because the show was kind of in the doldrums, it was sort of in the dumps, because um, the, the, the characterization of the Doctor in the Colin Baker era was wide, wildly unpopular in certain circles, including, unfortunately, the upper echelons of the BBC. Michael Grade really didn't like it. And I can sort of kind of see why. that There were problems. Colin is a great guy and a great actor, but they never quite got his era of the Doctor right. The, um, he had a terrible costume. Uh, and he was very unsympathetic. But there, I've often spoken to Eric Sayward, the script editor of that period, who's a very talented gent, and he's discussed why they did everything. And at every stage, the decision made sense, but it, it was the wrong decision, strangely enough. So, for instance, when the doctor regenerated, he initially couldn't, he was disorientated and he attacked the companion. And then Eric felt they couldn't instantly turn him into a nice guy, they had to slowly transition him. But it really, what it, what it ended up was is that you had this rather harsh and un- unsympathetic doctor in a dreadful costume and somehow they never got themselves out of that corner. 
So you, you said I came in at an interesting time. I came in on the coattails, not no pun intended, <laughs> the, 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 the dreadful overcolored coattails of the Colin Baker era. And as I all the people involved were very smart people, but what had happened, the end result hadn't worked. One of those ideas that looked good on yeah, paper. Yeah, I mean, but it, not, uh, for example, the, the companion, Mel, on paper she was supposed to be this smart, cookie computer scientist, but she ended up just being this girl who screamed all the time. So uh, Doctor Who had reached a low in popularity both in, in terms of the general public, but more importantly, in terms of the BBC hierarchy. Now, when you came on to the show and uh, in your discussions with John Nathan Turner, did he kind of have a blueprint for how he wanted nope. to change that, or was no, that all no, left up no, to you? No, 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 no. Uh, in fact, initially, we weren't going it wasn't the case of changing anything. It was just a case of getting. I had the shelf with no scripts on it, and the job was to get all the scripts for the season on that shelf, like literally physical scripts. So that was what we did. But by the time we were doing, even while I was doing that, I'd begun to see what I liked about Doctor Who, what I didn't like, and what I liked was classic stories like The Talents of Wen Chiang, which I still think is one of the greatest stories ever. And what I didn't like was Trial of the Time Lord, if I can give two strong examples. <laughs> so I, I knew what to do and what not to do, and I'd started, to, and my ideas refined themselves both through looking at what had been done before, but also what I was trying to do myself. Now, as the show progressed, obviously, um, Sylvester's character of the Doctor, his characterization changed quite a bit from the kind of. Uh, he was sort of Light a bumbling, bumbling clown to start with because nobody, none of us knew what we were doing. We were just fumbling in the dark. But that rapidly changed. We soon began to see what worked, what didn't, and where we wanted to go with it. Where would you eventually project that he would have wound up? I know there's a lot of people that have talked about this, about the, the Cardinal Master Plan. Were there, were there things that you had that you wanted to instigate for The, the Cardinal for Master Plan, had, although it was never called that at the time, and I blush, <laughs> I, I blush to use the term, but my intention had pretty much been fulfilled by the time we... The stories that we were doing in our final season, stories like Survival or Fenric um, or Ghostlight, you know, these wonderful stories, and, and, and not to downgrade Battlefield, which was terrific too. Um, we we ha- had achieved what we'd set out to do, so we would have continued in that direction, so to speak, because we had... The crucial thing was to make the Doctor more, to repeat myself, formidable and... Uh, enigmatic. A little more mysterious. Exactly. Yeah. I liked the idea. There's, um, I don't know specifically if it's attributed to you, but I've read other people talk about that one of the pieces to this they consider is that the three, that the Doctor may have actually been one of the founding members. I, of the I, I thought society. that that would, that would be a simple way, because I wanted him to be more than just a Time Lord, as the, and that crops up in the yeah. dialogue. I thought that would be a simple way of doing it. You had these characters, these sort of demigods who'd been there at the creation of Gallifrey. I thought if we pushed him back there... He was more than a time lord. I had no specific, and I would have pushed him back further. So we, we just don't know who he is. Just push him back into the shadows. That was my idea. Is there any truth to the idea that he may have wound up being Rassilon at one point? Sure, but I, you see, I would never want to specify or tie him down to be any one specific thing because then you've answered the question again. Right. The question is Doctor. Yeah, yeah. So, so I just wanted to, well, to, to shove him back into being an the enigma. No- the novels kind of expand on that, and that there was the character the other. Yeah. And no one knew where he came the from. The other's better because he's a mystery, right? Yeah, yeah. He, he's, yeah. He, even in Galfrey and Society, he's a mystery. Yeah. So that, that, would, that would be the natural loophole, I think, to go through. But, but whatever work would, would have worked and would have left him as an unanswered riddle, that would have been what I would have done. Now, I understand there were a series of scripts that were written for the uh, Colin Baker season that was not produced. Did you guys have anything beyond that, that would have been made? Uh, had the show continued for, for season 27? The, the, you, you, I, well, I wasn't aware that there were unused Colin Baker scripts. There were apparently there, there were, there were, there were, there were, uh, there were story, story ideas that had been pitched, I think, yeah. at least. The Nightmare uh, Fair was one of them, and there were a couple of those big finishes now it, picked it's, up the It's unlikely those, that there was any actually fully finished They may scripts. not have been fully yeah. finished, but I think they had some Oh, yeah, so this was the, the, the missing The missing The missing season before yeah. Trial of the Time Well, yeah. that, that, they would have been, as you said, um, unfinished storylines not totally developed and we had similar things for for me for season 27 some of which we've drawn upon for Big Finish Adventures which <laughs> included um, uh, Animal and Earth Aid and The Crime of the Century and Thin Ice You mentioned that in your uh, earlier panel that one of the, your regrets was not getting to write an episode yourself Well it was a, it was a case of me 
I had the opportunity and I didn't take it, so that's that is my big regret. <laughs> Do you anticipate or have you have you thought about maybe doing that with Big Finish or? Well, I've done I've done stuff with Big Finish. I've done, I've done a fair amount, but I'd really like to write for the TV show if the, that opportunity ever presented itself. Have you contacted Stephen Moffat? <laughs> I, I I meet Stephen quite a lot, but it's very obvious that he's got his full. Um, quota of writers but you know we'll wait and see if the opportunity if the time is right then I'd jump at the chance excellent uh, one of the questions I got was what your favorite story from the Seventh Doctor's era was oh, it, it, that changes from time to time but the one that's most consistently number one is Remembrance of the Daleks Glenn wants to know uh, was the Ace Trilogy planned and if the show were to continue were there have been more stories exploring her backstory and her history so that would have, would have been Fenric Ghostlight and Survival correct yeah um they just arose naturally because she was such an interesting character and also because, let's face it, it's easier to write for the companion than the Doctor because the Doctor's kind of Teflon-coated. You know, like he's, he's uh, nothing sticks to him. Could, and that's the way he should be. We shouldn't know about his family background. He shouldn't have a family. So it was easy and attractive to write for Ace. And I think it would have continued, but we would have always have had to watch the balance because it's the Doctor's show. What was it like working on Doctor Who with all the drama that was going on? Oh, me- meaning that... that uh, yeah, luckily, w- what you're referring to there is the fact that Doctor was not a popular show in the BBC and it was headed for cancellation. Uh, I think that's what they mean. Is that what they mean? Um, I, think so. I think so. Yeah, uh, well, the thing is, the fact is, I was completely unaware, blissfully unaware of what was going on behind the scenes until they gave us the chop. So, so it didn't really affect me until it was too late. You can look at the um, big finish stories to get get a flavor of the kind of ideas we were doing but the, the big thing for the next season is we would have been looking towards writing ace out and a new companion and that was that would have been the big new change if not in that season in the following one okay um you have a book uh script doctor? yeah my book script doctor while i was working on doctor who i kept a diary and um which was great because I was able to draw on this diary and write my memoir about working on Doctor Who, and it brings it back to life totally. I wrote down the things that happened, the things that people said. It's like this wonderful little documentary snapshot of that year. It's a little time capsule. So, in all modesty, if anybody's interested in the Seventh Doctor era, you should check out Script Doctor. There's no other document like it. And I plan on purchasing one, but for our listeners that may not have the opportunity to come and see, where can they get it? Um, Well, what you should do is... Google the publisher, and the publisher got the weirdest name in the world, which is M I W K. Okay? <laughs> so if you just look up uh, Script Doctor M I W K, you'll find a link and find a way of buying it. And if you ever see me, I'll autograph your copy. Excellent. Mr. Cardinal, thank you very much for joining us. Real we really pleasure. appreciate it. Thank and, you, guys. Uh, this has been, uh, been an actual treat. Well, very cool. Interesting insights there. Yeah. He, he, he was, and just based on that, we had to go buy the book. I mean, it was like, yeah, yeah it's. So I, I want to read the book now. I'm, I'm looking for, <laughs> I'm looking for listening it. to him, he's, and he was in his 30s, early 30s when he was doing Doctor Who, or was he maybe even, younger even than, that. than yeah, that? Yeah, I think he, uh, I think it was late 20s. Late 20s. So quite quite a uh, an interesting dynamic there to have somebody so young working on the series and, and somebody with fresh ideas, but but basically running the show there. I mean, as far as the script editor goes and, and crafting a, a plan for the series. So. I will say there, were, there was a moment, and they, they mentioned it several different times on different panels throughout the course. Of, it was brought up at the Radio Free Scarrow bit with, with, with Andrew Cartmel, and again later, and, and he mentioned it there, where you know you, you look at the, the kind of template that... Um, oh, what's the last episode? Survival. Uh, survival, thank you. I kept wanting to say Scarface. I was like, that's not it. Mean, my brain. Uh, but you, you, you look at where survival leaves off and then immediately go and watch Rose and see where it picks up. And they talk about this just absolute wonderful bridge work that happens between these two episodes. And my teeth sat on edge just a little bit. <laughs> because there's not. There, there is a bridge between those two episodes. It's called Doctor Who the Movie. And it was 1996. And it was wonderful. And you should... But... I, I had to kind of back off of that because the hackles were kept going up, and it, I don't believe that's how it was intended. It's right, just right. That they're, they're talking about the fact that New Who definitely lends itself to its roots yes, in yes, more ways yeah, than one, yes. but specifically from a storytelling spe- uh, element of the companion with where they were going with Ace and right. where they came it's, in with Rose is and, where they were trying to go. And, and, and what's been called the Ace Trilogy, where they were really exploring the character of Ace between... Uh, uh, survival. I'm going backwards. Survival, Curse of Fenric, and Ghostlight. Yeah, 
um, where they were really spinning that character and really kind of taking the perspective from the companion's point of view and really focusing on the companion. They also picked up and did that with Rose. And that for that first season, we talk about how much Rose is from the first person perspective, from, from Rose's perspective as we're introduced to the doctor. But there really a lot of that first season is, is, is very Rose centered, very Rose centric. So I can see where the comparison is where those particular, that particular storytelling kind of set the groundwork for the type of story storytelling they told from Rose on, at least for that first uh, season or uh, that's yeah. Season series one. Yeah. So that, that was, that was cool. And just to make sure that the book, the name of the book is known, it's called script doctor. The Inside Story of Doctor Who, 1986 to 1989 by Andrew Cartmel, with an introduction by Stephen Moffat, and yeah. another introduction by Sylvester McCoy. Yeah, that's and an cool. afterword by Sophie Aldred. They, yeah, I can't wait to read it. And an after afterword by Sean Collins. <laughs> <laughs> 257 pages of full-color photographs and only three pages with any actual writing on them. <laughs> wow. That was, that was a brain donor's joke. Yeah. Um, so after that, um, we had a seventh doctor time frame there because we we saw Andrew Cartmell and then we went to go see Miss Sophie Aldred to get her autograph. It took us all weekend long because the way they had um, some of the classic companions like Sophie, Caroline Ford, and Janet Fielding and uh, Wendy Padbury was they had it was kind of like staggered times. You know, they would have two people this time at this table, two people at this time. It was kind of mm-hmm. weird, and it took us a bit. You know, to find Sophie. It's like, find Sophie. <laughs> okay, I've located the photos. Ooh. Oh. Hey. Very cool. One end, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't notice it at That's the time he right. signed it. I That's was right. I was squeeing a little bit over the moment that it was getting the answer to both. Very cool. <laughs> Mel told me I should just put another end on there. and you know, <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't bring myself to it. Makes it unique. Well, and here's well, the funny thing: of all the photos that we we because we, we we knew Sean just handed me my autograph we picture kidding. from John uh, Barrow, 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 Barrow and and Captain Jack. Captain Jack, yes. <laughs> we knew that you wanted something Doctor Who and not Torchwood, right? I right. knew that, but the only one that was really there was the one with him in that blue T-shirt, right? And you said, oh, "I want something of him actually in costume." And, and the then it dawned on me after, <laughs> yeah, after after our whole conversation. <laughs> It dawned on me that is him in his jumper in Boomtown. In Boomtown, <laughs> which we just <laughs> watched so for the story. We're yeah. sitting there watching Boomtown. We're going to like, okay, we're ready. Open that door. Ha! It is his shirt. <laughs> <laughs> but I agree with you. That's he not, looks more Captain Jack. I don't. Yeah, I, totally. I, and yeah, she commented yeah. through the whole episode. I don't like this outfit. It's not a good either. look on him. And it's he shows, casual. Well, when they go, to, we're going to go stop the evil Slovene woman, and he shows up, and he's wearing like a members only jacket and gloves. <laughs> right, and right. Like, what? <laughs> I was like, take that off. I'd rather you have no clothes yeah. on than talk like now. I'm going to show this to you and not Keith because I think we're just going to make him suffer just okay. a little bit longer. <gasps> Ooh. <laughs> that was my wow. idea. My ideal. I'm totally taking credit for this. I don't care what Who Sean says. Who drew that? That's I did. incredible work. <laughs> I did not. That is some incredible work. Okay, we'll, 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 we'll give it to him. Here, 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 here. Ooh. <laughs> That is really cool. Now, unfortunately, the top third of it is awesome, and the bottom third of it is <laughs> yeah. awesome. But right there in the, the middle, the reason why we have, I, we have dominators. Reason, no, I'm oh, talking about the oh, dominators. The, being the, the reason best. why I picked it out though <laughs> is because I remember Not specifically him it? talking yeah. about quirks and how it's much he more loved them. It's a little more stylized, okay. but that's them. And it's like and he's got enough Cybermen. We, we 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 wanted we, we we looked at them and I I almost went with the Cybermen because like, no. Zoe and the Cybermen but it was like then we saw the corks and went no I like the yeah. corks because he's not he's Cybermen you can get with any photo oh yeah you can get any doctor we can get any doctor with Cybermen you're not gonna get corks with anybody no, else really so not. we 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 went with the corks Actually, those, those do like they, they look like posed actors instead of the actual I could, maybe it's the uh, artist and his friend. <laughs> Either way, this awesome. guy looks a lot like the the guy in the but this one guy. In, this looks like Channing Tatum. No, oh, <laughs> I, I don't know if I'd go that far. Well, we also talked with uh, a, a most an, another incredible gentleman, the one, the only da, da, da. Nicholas Briggs. And I will I will sound a spoiler alert warning here. <laughs> because I wondered if you were going to. It, it did not dawn on me at the time of the interview because I'm you know. 
I'm conducting interviews. I'm a serious journalist. And inside, I'm like, tell me a story. There's photos <laughs> of me sitting on the ground just listening to Andrew Cartmel. You yeah. know, as, you know I, I look like I'm three. Um, and same thing with, with Mr. Nicholas Briggs. And then uh, I asked a question, and he launched into it and started telling some stories. And it wasn't until he got to that moment that I went, oh, you're going to – yeah, he went there. <laughs> <laughs> so – Having said that, if you have not listened to the Eighth Doctor Adventures, um, which we just started reviewing, <laughs> if you're following along with us, you actually may want to give this interview a bit of a pass because it does spoil the end of the arc um, in 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 quite dramatic, graphic ways. <laughs> there, there's no there's no misconstruing what happens in this uh, in this bit, um, and it's the, it's the end of the uh, it's the end of the fourth season specifically that he's talking about before they launch into the next box set. But uh, it does spoil it, so just just wanted to sound that warning. If you don't care, by all means, plunge right ahead because he was a joy to talk to. Hello, I'm Nick Briggs, and I'm the voice of the Daleks and the executive producer of Big Finish. Now um, we are huge fans. Uh, as I'm discovering more and more people are a <laughs> big finish, which is fantastic. Um, tell us a little bit about how this came to be and your involvement in it. Big Finish. Well, uh, Big Finish is a company owned by Jason Hay Gallery, who's uh, the co-executive producer and my boss. Uh, and he um, created the company quite a long time ago. And I think one of the first things he did was uh, co-finance um, a Doctor Who spin-off uh, fan film called Shakedown. I think that's how that happened. Anyway, um, that's the one for Santara, isn't it? That's right. Shakedown, yes, yeah. and shot on HMS Belfast in the Thames, uh, doubling as a spaceship. Um, <laughs> we uh, many years ago, Gary Russell and I had done a series of uh, amateur fan Doctor Who audios uh, for a fan company called Audio Visuals, in which I played the Doctor. And the Daleks, funny enough. And um, Gary ended up being the producer, having written for it before. And we always said when we finished doing them, when we grew up and got jobs, uh, that we would love to do it for real and get a license from the BBC. And one day, uh, Gary, who knew Jason very well from childhood, you know, they, they were childhood friends, um, got together and decided the time had come to ask the BBC to get a license to do audio Doctor Who drama. This was 1996-ish, and the TV movie had just happened, or was just about to happen, or something like that. And the BBC were expecting Doctor Who to, you know, come back and be a huge series. So they said no to the request for a license. Uh, and so then Gary and Jason decided to do something similar, and they got the rights to Bernice Summerfield, who'd been a character in the Virgin publishing Doctor Who novels, the and then adventures. and then they'd spun her off when the license for the novels went back to the BBC. Virgin Publishing carried on doing Bernice Summerfield's novels. And so Jason and Gary thought, wouldn't it be a good idea if we got a, a licensing agreement with Virgin? And so we did audios based on those. Uh, so and a couple of years later, they went back to the BBC and asked them again. This time the BBC knew there wasn't going to be a series of Doctor Who. They were more open to the idea, plus the fact that they had some productions to show them, like this is this is what we can do and how exciting it can be. And they got the uh, license as a result of that. Right from the word go, Gary told me that I was going to be directing uh, a lot of them. I asked if I could write the first one. He said, no, no, no. Uh, that's going to be for people who've written Doctor Who novels, recognised writers by the BBC. At that time, he lived five minutes away from me. So on his five-minute journey back, somehow he must have changed his mind. <laughs> Because when he got home, he phoned me and said, I've changed my mind, I think you should write the first one. One of the main reasons for it being, apart from the fact that presumably he thought I was a good writer, <laughs> you'd have to ask him about that, um, is that he wanted it to be secret. And he knew that I, if I was part of the inner circle, you know, the news wouldn't spread out. So it was well underway before we uh, announced it. Yeah. So that's how it came about. And then I, was, I, I wrote and directed and did sound design and music. Well, the first one I wrote, directed, did the sound design and the music. Almost uh, a one-man band. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, there were some other actors. <laughs> and some people did the design of the cover. Um, uh, and I, I did all that stuff for, for it for quite some time, for about seven years. And then Gary resigned and went to the BBC to become a script editor there, BBC Wales. And I stepped up to the plate and decided that I could 
you know, uh, do a similar role, not the same role. We redefined it as executive producer and brought in a line producer because Gary had been doing it all and I think it rather destroyed him <laughs> um, and I didn't want to go that way and my skill set is not the same as Gary's. So, uh, so we've remodelled Big Finish and I've been doing it for, I think, probably over eight years now or coming up for... Yeah, yeah, it is over eight years I've been doing it for. You guys just celebrated a pretty big milestone anniversary. 15, 15, 15 years, yeah. Are there moments when you're writing a, a Doctor Who story that the fan is maybe coming out going, huh, this is going to be cool, and then you maybe have to step back and put the producer hat on and go, no, I can't do that. <laughs> is that an internal struggle? No, um, uh, I think that starts at the beginning when I think, oh, would this be a cool story? And I talk to someone about, you know, to, to David Richardson or Alan Barnes, the script editor, about, you know, what sort of story I should be writing. Um, but while I'm writing it, I'm totally, as I've always been, right from a kid when I wrote stories, totally... Uh, involved in the uh, the world that I've created in the story and it's all to do with making sense with things tying up and with, with the characters being true to themselves stuff like that that, that kind of form the plot I'm always surprised when uh, other writers say and many writers do say it you know like I, I put that in because I kind of thought it would be cool and it never occurs to me I'm not cool enough I don't, I don't think of these things I don't think you know it, they, yeah, I like to put characters in impossible situations and see how they, you know, and and cram them into a corner almost and see how they bust their way out, you know. So that's what I'm thinking about. I, I'm too busy trying to get it right and make it work to think whether something's cool or great or fun or not. Hopefully it's fun because I'm consumed by a sense of fun about Doctor Who anyway. It's my, you know, great passion. Have you ever had one that you, you, you put them in the impossible situation and then got stuck and just, oh, that's not going to work? Yeah, I, yeah, I've, I've, got, <laughs> I've got stuck many times, but then I then I seek help, um, you know, and quite often it's Alan Barnes. I, uh, I mean, there was, um, at the end of uh, uh, Lucy Miller, that one, Lucy Miller, and then there was To the Death, uh, at the end of Lucy Miller, the, the, the climax, I... I I realised I'd got to a point where the end of Lucy Miller was going to be the, the Doctor was apparently dead. Now, and I, I phoned Alan, Alan Barnes, and said, I seem to have worked myself into a corner where, where the Doctor's dead at the end of this first segment. And, you know, how much of a shock is that when we know that he can't be, you know? It's pretty and, much the worst cliffhanger ever. Yeah, <laughs> like, I don't the believe Doctor's it. dead. But, you know, and then we talked about the emotional content of the show and how it had progressed to that point in the story and he said but it's not about is he going to be alive or not it's to do with the emotional impact on Lucy and and once he you know it's pretty obvious looking back at it that that's the obvious thing to do once he made that really clear to me then suddenly suddenly I had something to hang the story on and that it was wasn't just about oh will he survive it was more to do with how devastated will Lucy be and how desperate will she be for him to come back to life and then, of course, I was able to do the heartbreaking thing in the next story where she's there with his apparent dead body or, you know, he's not going to recover. And she's saying, look, look, I want to travel with you forever. I'm sorry about all the other stuff. Let's do this. And she starts sort of romanticizing about how brilliant it's going to be for the two of them to be together. And, of course, she dies. You know, <laughs> that, that makes it, you know, doubly horrible. I'm telling you the plot. <laughs> It was a, a brilliant capstone to the, the Ace Doctor Adventures, which is where I started with Big Finish. Right, I, yes. I, I came into it with the Ace Doctor Adventures and kind of ran through those. Paul McGann, I really felt, was an unsung the, the hero for Doctor Who. I, just, I loved the TV movie. And you guys have continued that with all of this stuff. And it was after I got through that run that we went back and started kind of sampling them. And we worked them into the podcast where we... We review things and, and come up. We've kind of bounced around, so there's several of them that we haven't got to. And uh, I mean, you guys have such a, a variety, that's such a, a just breadth of yeah. material at this point after 15 years. So we're really looking forward to delving into it. Um, and I know one of the things that we and our listeners constantly comment on when we go back and review these stories is thank you for managing to get the Six Doctors characterization right. The, the, it's, it's, the, the people at Big Finish seem to take very great pride and care in tweaking things it's like we know what they were going for but didn't quite get to on the well, show we want to stop that's that something that bit. Colin Baker said to us or said to Gary particularly he also said it to me but said it to Gary and he and Gary were, were you know sure not made certain that they, they made those adjustments really Colin yeah. said I don't want any more of that abrasive stuff you know he's got that in him but you know we want to show other sides of him and Gary was very keen to do that and so it's thanks to him and Colin really who made that happen and I just I just picked up on that theme when I took over and, and I've continued it. 
Um, we unfortunately missed your panel on the sneak peek. Is there anything you want to tell our listeners that you know for oh, 2015? Well, any any big thing that you really want to pimp? Well, I know just to <laughs> say that you know the whole thing about Kate Stewart and unit yeah. extinction. She's the first of the new series characters. You know we we've, we've got involved in something, but she won't be the last. Um, they're about to start recording uh, next month with Paul McGann for the new sequence of stories from him, you know, After Dark Eyes. It's a sequence called uh, The Doom Coalition, and the first episode is called The Eleven. Um, what else? Sylvester McCoy makes a cameo appearance in the Colin Baker box set, The Last Adventure. Um, there was one other thing. Oh, yes, and Colin Baker and Miranda Raisin start recording in a couple of months' time with the new uh, Sixth Doctor and Constance uh, stories. Constance is a new companion for the Sixth Doctor. Okay. His reign's really good for us. We can just insert lots of things in there. That gives us actually just a little bit of relief. When the news was announced just recently about the last adventure, and yeah. it's, it's the Sixth Doctor's last adventure, and we kind of went, well, surely they don't mean it that way. No, it's we they're don't. doing mean, the last adventure, Exactly, we don't last. mean it that way. <laughs> we just mean it that we'll just deal with that area, and then we'll go back and carry on in this enormous area. We decided know. that's how we were going to take it, but I think internally we're all like, hmm. Oh, I know, we noticed. <laughs> I, I don't think we really anticipated that people would think that, you know, but there you go. Yeah, we're, we're carrying on. It's <laughs> good to know. Um, now, one last, well, not really one last question, because I, I would talk to you for hours, but <laughs> let me. Um, I think we're all right. There's no one queuing. Yeah. If... Um, I imagine through the licensing with BBC, it's probably a little bit of a minefield to navigate at times with a writer produces a, a particular script and you guys think, hey, this is great, and then you have to get it cleared and then it comes back. Are there times when it's like, no, we just, you know, or, or do they kind of give you carte blanche to do whatever you would like within well, reason? Um, we submit every storyline we come up with. And sometimes if we've got something which we think is a particular sort of uh, a, a particular type of story we'll flag it up even before a storyline is written with the BBC and say is, is this okay is this going to fit you know we're thinking of doing this are we alright to use the master at the moment because you know when they were doing the John Sims stuff Russell T Davis said don't use the master for now uh, so yeah, we, we, we have communication with the BBC and we never get to the point where a script's written and it's not okay. allowed we always the storyline has to be submitted so we submit sometimes Quite a lot of the time we submit just one-liner ideas and say, is this okay? Uh, but all the time we submit full storylines and the BBC can comment on that. And the main thing they're worried about is whether it, you know, uh, is off-brand in any way. Sure. And, but their, their attitude to that is largely like, we're concerned about this area there, just want to make sure that when you actually get to the script stage that you don't do X, Y and Z, you know, and you keep this this violence or whatever yeah, under control. Name, great, if not a I imagine oh, you have a, a uh, pretty okay. stable uh, stable of, uh, of uh, writers. Mm. Is there any possibility that Big Finish will open its doors to submissions at some point in time down the road? Well, we'd, ideally, we'd like to be doing that all the time, but to do it with any sense of quality control takes sure. time and effort, and it's almost like we need another, another organisation to do it. Right. But there'd be no point in that because we're the people who have to produce them so we have to do it so I don't know the last time we did it we nearly broke Alan Barnes because he insisted on reading everyone's and giving responses you know that's it's a huge task so yeah um, you know we do let new writers in occasionally it's quite difficult it's, there's no shortage of people who want to do it there's a huge shortage of people who can do it who can do it, who can do it. Yeah. Um, thank you Thank you very much. Uh, we continue to look forward to uh, your work and the work of Big Finish and all of the doctors and everybody that you get in, all of the side stuff. Uh, it's just been wonderful. And uh, keep up the good work. Thank you. That's, uh, it's so encouraging to hear that, and it's so brilliant to meet people who enjoy our work. And that, you know, that's why I come to these events, you know, to, to make contact with people and, you know, for people to tell me, you know, what they like and what they don't like, and, you know, for us to bear all that in mind. So thank you. Thank you for your positive feedback. It really uh, means a huge amount because, you know, and also you and everyone else who buys the stuff, you're actually paying for it to be made. You know, we don't get any funding from anywhere. Yeah. It's the money that, you know, so that's... Yeah, thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. <laughs> all right, very good. Spoilerific. So after his... Um Awesome interview. Then uh, I think we roamed a while, roamed a while for a little while, and then uh, did that last tour through the dealer's room to see if they're. Oh, Spia, dealer's room. I'm sorry. 
we bought, Sean has this thing where he refuses or should, um, does not want to buy anything in the dealer's room that we can't buy at home, which is a total... Oh, I totally... It makes, it makes I, sense. Totally yeah, agree. It's totally totally the most agree. logical thing. Yes, then very we, logical. Then uh, I, can't, I thought we were in there. We did something. I can't remember what panel... Because we were in there way in before the year view. Because I can't. It says uh, twenty classic seasons, and then previously on Doctor Who. But we. That's what it was. We we caught the the hind. Well, no, we caught all of the the previous on Doctor Who, which was Nicholas Briggs, who, much to his oh, surprise, yeah, he did the was, was all. hosting that panel, which he didn't know he was hosting. <laughs> uh, apparently, but if was, you're gonna grab somebody to host a panel, though, Nicholas Briggs, yeah. he's very yeah, very he's seasoned at it. He's done a lot. Yeah. Of stuff. Okay. Not this alone. is who was on it. Was Nicholas Briggs, um, P. Ford. E. George. P. Ford. Uh, that's Paul Ford. Well, I don't know the Phil first Ford. names. Phil Ford. Phil Ford. Phil Ford. <laughs> See, that's why I just I said, said it in my brain went, Now no. I know exactly why Mel said P. Ford. P. That's Ford. why I didn't want to go there. So I will say the initials and you guys Phil Ford. Phil okay. Ford. So E. George. Elias. Elias P. George. Harness. Patrick. Uh, no. Peter. Peter Harness, yes. Uh, D. Hardgreaves. Uh, Danny. Gre- Danny Hardgreaves. Danny, yeah. A. Jones. Now, this one I know. A. Jones. <laughs> a, a, Andrew? What A. Jones would that be? I don't it know. It doesn't say. But I know the next one. Okay. Jamie Matheson? Jamie Matheson. <laughs> <laughs> See, I got that one. I'm so proud of myself. And then R. Mullen? M. U. Richard. 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 Okay. C. Pritchard. And the, this one I do know. It's Dan Starkey was on there. And then R. Talloway? Rachel, Rachel, Tyler. Tyler. Rachel. Okay, yeah. so that's who was on the panel. Which Rachel was the director for Series Eight? It was yes. all people who worked on Series Eight. Right. So previously on Doctor Who, and it was kind of just them sharing some of their experiences mm-hmm. with uh, from so, the most recent season. From the most recent season. So we made sure, and it's really funny sitting on this panel because people start to strategize. You know, they look at the panels that are listed out, and they're like, "Okay, I know that um, the closing ceremonies are going to be busy because." It was funny when we ran into several people. It's like, okay, if you want a seat for closing ceremonies, we suggest that you get there. And I think we might have said this on a couple of reviews in the past. Make sure that you're on the panel before so you can get good seats. Apparently, a lot of people have heard that warning <laughs> because that panel was full. <laughs> we will take full credit. We will, yeah, we'll take full credit. Our because role. they don't clear rooms at Galley. No, they do not. So you sit in that panel, then that's where you get to sit for the closing ceremonies or whatever panel's next. So people, a lot of people have, have must have heard that warning or took that to heart because that was a full room. And that full room stayed for closing ceremonies <laughs> in the year-end review. <laughs> so, again, I think we owe to Mitch. Didn't Mitch get us seats for that, too? I think so. I think so. I don't remember now. Oh, Mitch is awesome. She got us good seats for most of it. <laughs> oh, actually, no, I think, no, we got the seats that time, and Mitch had oh, that's joined right. us. She joined us for that. That was our, yeah, so. our seats weren't as good as what she grabbed. So, but no, I mean, <laughs> I thought they were still good. But yeah, the one good. time, the whole con, at the very end, Sean finally gets to pay Mitch back. Yeah. <laughs> and they weren't as good. So, but we did the, that panel with him, which was. Ar- like- Arwen Jones was Ar- uh, A.A. Jones. Oh. He, he, he's the production gotcha. designer yeah. for all of, uh, well, most of Torchwood, a couple of, most of Doctor Who, all of Sherlock. He's, he's been around. Oh, yeah. And it was yeah. Paul, yeah. I think. Paul, Poor Paul. Um, <clears throat> I think it was Paul. Correct me if I'm wrong, Sean. Phil? Phil? Was it Phil? Phil. Phil. You, you said Paul. Yeah, That's I, right. Ford. Yeah, I did. <laughs> okay, so Phil. I'm sitting here going, Paul? Who's Paul? Poor Phil apparently oh, um, was there? Okay. participated in karaoke the night before. <laughs> I've heard he's so he frequently does it. He he didn't have much of a voice <laughs> on that panel. <laughs> when we saw him on the on the on the panel on Saturday, it was, we saw him Monday or uh, Friday. We saw him Friday at the opening thing. He's like, "I'm looking forward to a great gallery." When we saw him on Saturday, he was like, "I can't believe this is so great. Everything's awesome." When we saw him on Sunday, he was like. <laughs> <laughs> and when they finally got to the end where they bring everybody out on stage because that's you know at, at the end of the, they bring everybody out at the same time and then they pass the mic right, down right. Tony they, Lee was standing next to him and Tony Lee says he's lost his voice next <laughs> 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 he, says, he can't talk he says oh that's what I he goes 
Now he's going to do uh, interpretive dance. Interpretive dance to say his thank you to you. <laughs> and Phil, to his credit, jumped right up because all the writers apparently moved down and they were all dangling their feet off the end of the stage. You know, while the actors and stuff were behind him, he jumped down off the stage and was like. <laughs> and, you know, pantomiming. Two hearts. You know, I love you out of this heart. I love you out of that heart. It was awesome. So yeah, even though he had no voice, he said his thanks. So um, they kept coming out. It's like there was a lot. Well, yeah, a lot of I mean, it was, it was weird considering the number of cancellations that they they had to deal with, and you kind of thought, oh well, you know, uh, how much is this going to impact it? And for all of the drama that had to go along with that, and, and certainly our, our, my sympathies go out to Sean. And staff are being able to juggle all of that yeah, and deal with the yeah. media maelstrom that the certain fans that are, just are like that. But, and not, just but yeah, the, the guests change. just kept coming out, kept coming out, coming out, and the, you know that's why they eventually kind of looped around the stage and decided they were going to sit down here. So they, they lined the bottom <laughs> of the stage all the way, and then they were all the way across the, the, the back end as well. And that's also, of course, at the end of Sunday when a lot of guests have other commitments or they've already left the con or mm-hmm. you know different things have happened, and it was still full. It was still Bear full. Stage. Is that right? Captain Jack, did sure. not. Yeah, yeah, you, you had, had it. it. You had it. See, I did it right. <laughs> he was not there. Um, he was Saturday uh, only, right? No, he was Saturday. He was and, Saturday and Sunday. Saturday he and Sunday. Sunday but he, he had left. He, early, so. When we got his autograph uh, Saturday, um, he's like Scott's out driving around. <laughs> 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 so I imagine as soon as he got done with his panel and his autograph, he's he like, went driving with Scott. <laughs> he went driving with Scott. Well, you know, had to keep him off his phone. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, Tosh. Uh, Nakamori had left early. Yeah, Nakamori yeah. had left early. So, but it, it was funny to see all the people. Amazing, not funny. To see all the people that come out there. And Tony Lee, I think, was one that led. Uh, was the first one. You know, elusive Tony Lee, because once again, you never get to see him on anything because he's on the panel, you know, <laughs> and not at his table. But he come out. You guys have run into that many years. Yeah, he. he yeah. We we gave up. Yeah, <laughs> we, we finally we bumped into him in the hallway and we said, "Hey, it's the elusive Tony Lee," and he waved and was going to another panel. Yeah, he just gone. <laughs> So, but he jumped down and led the group. You know, first they started go circling stage, and then they realized their backs were to us, and we're like, "Well, that ain't gonna work." So they hopped down and sat down on the edge. And uh, Caroline Ford, and I think she did a little dance number or a little flourish when she came out. And the classic, they're my favorite. I mean, I love the new Who that and John and all of them, but the the classic ones that they. They took the stage, in my opinion, when they came out there. And Sophie, I think, um, I think she got the biggest hooray of all of them. Until <laughs> Ellis George came out. Yeah. With huh. her ribbons. <laughs> <laughs> and she had somebody hold she them. She took the microphone and ran. <laughs> and then ran to the other end of the stage, and all the artists, all the authors were down, you know, all the writers were underneath holding up this thing that <laughs> stretched corner all the way around the thing. And I think it was the largest collection of ribbons that we'd certainly seen. I don't wow. know what she say she had. She had over three hundred at that point, or something. Didn't no, she, she had more than that. I don't. I don't think. Did she give an exact number? She did. Yeah, I she can't had remember. A bunch. But yeah, it was. A, it was like wow. So yeah. she was all like, "I beat him! I beat him!" <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, and then they did. Uh, they did a year in review, or uh, after everyone said uh, their thanks, and you know. Everybody appreciative of Sean, not, not my Sean, the Sean. I got mistaken for the Sean, yeah. actually. Huh. Somebody in the hallway looked up, and we were talking to them, and they looked at my badge and went, oh, you're Sean. The Sean. And I went, yeah. And they said, the Sean. And I said, no. maybe. <laughs> no. Which the Sean? They said, Sean, you know, Sean Galley Sean. I'm like, no, I'm not that Sean. <laughs> I wish I was that Sean. I'm not that Sean. But um, yeah, no, it was it was a really good show. It was a lot of fun. And once the, the thing that I think is the, the well, let me let me let me do this real quick. Is that the the end of Galley? They always kind of give you the, the updates for next year. So next year we're getting Galley Free One Station Twenty Seven. Uh, once again, it'll be the twelfth through the fourteenth of February, twenty sixteen. What? Always oh, doing in February. Always do it in February. Yeah. Every year. Yeah. Oh, wait, for that one year, they're going to do it in March. And it's then nice. I get to go. Valentine's Day weekend. They get to go, and I don't have to worry about taking off work. And Tickets go on sale. I've got another job. <laughs> Was this right? May 1st? Or did yeah, they change May that? 1st. No. May 1st May is the change to date. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Because Sean apparently had the date up and then realized that he, he wasn't going he to be there. He, had, he was going to another con. And he Star was like, I'm Wars. not going to be there. For, oh, yeah, the Star Wars con. He's, He's like, I'm not going to be here he to says, run the I tickets. He made a mistake. He goes, the tickets go on sale April 17th. And then I realized, I'm not, because I'm going to Star Wars convention. We're moving that date. 
So Friday, May 1st, tickets go on sale, uh, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, mm -hmm. 6 p.m. UK. So it's kind of, once again... Changes this ch year. The, the changes are going to be that um, they are cutting down the number of three-day tickets, but they're going to reopen... The, the, the same number of tickets will be available, but not all of them will be three-day tickets. Some of those will be Friday only. Some of those will be Saturday only. Some of those will be Sunday only, mm -hmm. which I think is probably a good change. So it'll actually allow them to get more people in just on, on varying schedules. Well, and if there's that special guest, it, say, for instance, for us, not that <laughs> this will ever happen, but say, for instance, if NISA were to show up next year, we could buy tickets just for sp yeah. specifically. but. There's no way you're going to know that in advance. Because that's the problem. That's what, that, yeah, that's what I'm yeah. quite good. Yeah, that's they're, what they're I'm not gonna, They won't have any guests announced until after that. But just as a warning to our listeners, you know, if this is something that you're if you're interested in attending a Gallifrey one, and like I said, there were a lot of new people this year, and uh, it, it was really kind of cool to see that. And we, it, we've discussed before that maybe right, maybe this is it. Gonna, maybe we'll cut you know have a break after this year and try and hit Chicago. Let's all go to Chicago. Next year. I think I think we should try it for so. Chicago. Um, one thing that um, with the new people, or this year, this year, right? Are you talking about this year? Or are you talking about? I'm hold talking. Off I'm an talking about. Year. Well, I, I don't want to hold off an entire year, but financially, we might need to. But you know, uh, one thing I just filed the tax returns. So, well, you should plan for it now. Cons are looking pretty good. Now. <laughs> but as you've admitted, the two of you will never get off in November yeah. on Thanksgiving weekend. Oh, uh, right? Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving weekend, we're done with Yeah. Oh, we. Oh, but wow. both of us can't take off at the same but time. But we can't be off at the same time. Yeah. Well, but that doesn't preclude one of us from going down Friday and the other going down on Saturday and meeting yeah. up. I mean, kind of like British Fest. Right. That's what we did at British Fest. Oh, you worked true. on Friday and I was off. So. <coughs> or possibly contracting an illness. That's happened before, too. <laughs> <laughs> that was because of the sweeps. But. Not that we'd admit to that. But yeah, like I said, there, was a, there were a lot of new people this year. And one of the things that we took away from this, Galley, I think, is that while we had... We didn't get to nearly the number of panels and things that we wanted to do. Oh, I feel so bad. But we did get the social interaction with friends that we've met through Galley, and which a was whole kind bunch of a, of new a people, first for like that. Vanessa. But uh, you know, we actually—I mean, that's what you, if you look at our Facebook. Uh, I didn't post all the other uh, photos that we did on the trip. I just posted on our on our website. I just posted the, the actual Galley ones. But um, Monday, we spent hanging out with uh, Jerry and Megan, who were just a couple that we met at Galley four years ago. And I've only ever seen them at Galley, but I've become Facebook friends with them. Mm -hmm. And we saw them, and you know, we went and hung out at Santa Monica Pier. That was, just a, that was just a You guys a had joy. some great pictures you guys took down there, too. Yeah. They looked wonderful. Yes. I was, I, and I was Sean impressed. said that you know, it was really awesome to be able to have somebody with us to be able to take pictures of us together. And I couldn't have asked That's for a better, rare, you know, yeah. Yeah. you know. And, and I could tell that Megan and Jerry were ecstatic about being able to have you know, and Megan, she was so sweet. She goes, you should get a job, Sean, and just go with people on their vacations and take pictures of them. <laughs> <laughs> and Sean's like, okay, yeah, let's show me how to do that, sure. you know. Well, I said that. That's my, that's my new thing. I'm going to, you can hire me out. I will stalk you. <laughs> I'll jump you, out you, in surprise you, photos. You, you pay for me to go on your vacation with posed you. Posed and candid pictures. And I will yeah. take all the photos you want. You of you and your family. You, you know, just pay for uh, me to go. Dave and Lori did that for their wedding photographer. You remember they, 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 their photographer actually took their photo. They took their wedding photos. He charged them for that. And then he flew to London, London and Paris and took pictures of them there. And all they had to pay for was his trip. Yep. Mm -hmm. So they paid airfare and lodging. And then the pictures were all free. So that seems fair to me. Might be way to go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> my services are available. My photos are on my Facebook page. If you're interested, and he contact really me. Good photos. Back to what you guys were saying. Yeah, he does. And oh, I, again, I'll, I'll, it's I all I want to recall. It's all the just camera. Just in case, <laughs> just in case it missed it. You the the pictures that you took on the uh, at the pier, especially, or uh, yeah, was just the Santa Monica Pier. Well, they were wonderful. They were just they were so artful and you had this wonderful eye and so I want to compliment you. I, those were probably even though the other ones were filled with Doctor Who stuff and I, <laughs> I thoroughly loved those. Those were the most enjoyable because they were really it was like you were being very focused and taking your time and just really looking for the beauty. Well, Honestly, you know what, what a large part of that was was my subject mm -hmm. and I, I've commented on this before Mel really kind of came alive down. I don't know why but it, it, she smiles a lot in those pictures <laughs> and I'm not saying that she doesn't at home. It's hard not to smile though when you're on the beach. I, I think <laughs> that just California. You, you can, just, weather, you can nice definitely weather. tell the, uh, the the job and the kids and the house and everything had kind of <laughs> dropped <laughs> away because she car she carries vacation. the burden of this. I mean, she she is the rock of the relationship no, and allows no. me to have all the flights of fancy with you guys. And <laughs> so you know, to get her away from that, 
and see her lighten up was just not the, again not, lighten up's not the right word but she 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 lit up I'm she just she I'm really did it. <laughs> something that you guys brought up just a few minutes ago about how this was less panels and more socializing those that's what I like to do at cons I like to I, not necessarily if I know people then the socializing's fun but I kind of like to take them slow I don't like to over Whelm myself with panels. Just relax. And I, I want to relax yeah. and have some fun and just kind of mill around and take it at my own pace. And I think that's – I think you guys got frustrated with me the year we went to Galley because I kept taking off and just going yeah. doing things. And it was more because I just – I like to wander and mill and see what's going on instead of, you know, sticking to a schedule and saying, okay, I have to be here. I have to be – there was only two things I had to be at, and that was the panels that I went on. <laughs> <laughs> the same thing with British Fest. I mean, it's one of those things that, you know, I just want to go mill. And if I happen to end up in a panel, I end up in a panel. But it just it, – you know. So you guys kind of did this trip more of the way that I kind of took my well, mic on. Well, that's the way that Kansas we like Comic-Con's to do the same way. You know me, I'll go off and sit in the game room for, you know, an hour just to kind of rest and take yeah. it in and what yeah. people watch, so. And I think that's what we, it took us four years, I think, to finally come to the conclusion that it it doesn't need to be a rushed, scheduled event. Slow down, take your time, and enjoy yourself. Because yeah. it's just And avail yourself of the hospitality suite. <laughs> find, and, and again, and I think we've said this on times past, find that hospitality suite because the Calafrey people are awesome. They supply you because I don't think Mitch would have ate. The entire day, <laughs> if it hadn't been for, you know, eat this, you know, go to the hospitality booth. I know that's what, you know, Megan and Jerry even made into the comment that um, they foraged <laughs> there at the <laughs> at the hospitality booth. Uh, you know, the cookies or crackers or chips or whatever they, you know, have laying out because you don't want to leave. It's so awesome. Well, it's also nice that where they've got it situated is right off the pool. So that you can go outside, and just kind of, sit. and that's where I took a couple of photos right, at right. out there. Was just to be able to kind of sit and be hey, outside. You rubbing it in there, though. <laughs> no, 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 I just <laughs> no, I I'm saw the pool. The pool. Like, oh, <laughs> you <laughs> rubbing it in. So nice. Just to be able to go and sit outside and not have the noise of okay. the convention hall yep. and the. Speaking of pool, though, um, Sherman, um, Derek Sherwin, Derek Sherwin. <laughs> that's another thing. We, we happen to be out there. And getting in the hot tub with Sadie and Cindy, enjoying the hot tub, and getting out. And Sean's like, honey, come over here. Because Sean happened to be standing up there drying off because he got out before I did. And lo and behold, there's Derek. And he's like, wow, she has a lot of ink. <laughs> <laughs> the exact phrase, because Derek Sherman's room was right off the pool. So he was outside enjoying the smoke. And he looked up and he says, that is a painted lady. Painted lady. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you say to I that? Don't other know how to take that? What, what, what do you say to that other than Mel? Come here. <laughs> that's what he did. But we sit there at the side of the pool and talk to him for about thirty-five, forty minutes, and he's just an interesting man to talk to. And that's what Gallifrey, this convention, is all about. It's, that's an intimate con. It, yeah. It's yeah. very, and that's what I tell people. It's we go to all kinds of cons, and I'm not putting down any other con that we've gone to or will go to. But Gallifrey is just a very family-oriented bunch of people. Until Barrowman shows up. <laughs> Barrowman. Barrowman. And it's no longer family-friendly. Who knows? You might uh, pee alongside uh, Michael Jason. Michael Jason. Yeah, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> right? I was so disappointed. I did not share a pee schedule with anybody. <laughs> <laughs> kind of hard to when you're not in the same hotel. And, I, I, just, and I kept going. and it makes it sound like I was stalking Michael Jason. <laughs> but it was just really I was stalking the, everybody. We were all the really same really schedule. schedule. I'm just I standing just at the urinal going, I recognize any of these people. No. <laughs> no. One thing that... Uh, you're not a Doctor Who fan until you've peed alongside a Doctor Who <laughs> character. Yeah. One, uh, one thing else I'd like to say is that you could tell that this comment came from someone who had never been to the con before. As they're riding up the escalator... You could hear, she says, shh. And I'm thinking, she was talking to me because I was looking away and I look back up at her because she's ahead of me going up the escalators and she's talking to her companion and she's telling her companion, she goes, just listen. It gets louder the further up the escalator you get. She goes, isn't it awesome? And it was just, you could tell it was the first time she had been there, you know, and she was still amazed at the roar that LobbyCon, and it's not even necessarily LobbyCon because I didn't think that was Thursday because we were coming down from downstairs well, they, going up. Uh, just from well, my regular, there was people. There were people night. in the yeah. lobby all the time, oh, yeah. going oh, around yeah. in between. Yeah. I mean, and it wasn't hotel guests. It was 
Who gets? I mean, it was LobbyCon just kind of starts at probably yeah. Tuesday anymore. And just, <laughs> yeah, just goes, goes straight, straight the through yeah. to the next Tuesday. So, but we're wrapping it up because yep. we we don't want to go too long. We've run but, way um, too long. But I would me. Anything else you guys want to <laughs> hit on real quick before we close uh, it? One other change that um, Sean said that was going to happen with the rooms because he said he found that the rooms and the ticket thing was a total nightmare. That um, he found that, or they found that people were. Um, buying like 10 tickets and their friends were buying 10 tickets so that there's not going to be any ticket exchange or what do you call it transfers yeah. anymore yeah. that's not going to happen you buy a ticket plus you know plus you could transfer but it was in person right at galley at, at galley, galley. Yes. Nothing the t- of time. you are the name ticket and then you could buy right. like five additional tickets but those tickets will be unnamed until the day you show up at the call right. line and mm-hmm. you can say this ticket is for so and so and so and so and so and so um, they're hoping that that will um, cut down on the same issue that they had with the room reservations. That um, so and so booked five rooms, and so and so's friend booked the same. You know, mm. you know. So or they're hoping that that will alleviate. Like if I that booked a room issue. and you booked a room and Keith booked a room, all thinking that well, we're going to need an additional one for for Glenn and Keith. So I'm going to book three rooms, and you're going to book three rooms because you thought the same thing, and you booked three rooms, and then yeah. we find out oh, we actually have nine rooms and we didn't need them. Yeah. Well, and somebody didn't even realize or remember that they had a room until that Monday that they called and canceled their reservation at the Marriott. <laughs> so there's a room that would have been available. There would have been a room yeah, available yeah. for Sean and I. Not to be, you know, <clears throat> picky. But, you know, we could have been at the hotel, at the convention, which makes it so much easier. And not, not, you know, I'm so grateful that Mitch thought of us when she got the room. But to be able to stay in the hotel where the con at is just... <clears throat> And we should say the Four Points wasn't bad. Being just oh, no. Down. It's, four it's the one that was, was just awesome behind. Uh-huh. Um, and it was, it was a nice But you don't get to pee <laughs> with, with, a, with a celebrity as much as you've been able to if you had been in the con. Or have that drink or have that elevator ride. or yeah, take just you know. in, invite Michael Jason over to use the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Four <laughs> Points has got an awesome Pee my hotel. <laughs> I'm sure he would. Might be a little creepy if you told Michael Jason to come up and pee in your hotel room. You should totally email him and say, I don't know if you remember me. I was in the bathroom next to you at Galley Multiple last year. Times. Oh, Hilda. Oh, I remember you. I've been <laughs> unable to go since you got back to England. It's been two years. It's, it's, it's been really rough. I'm, I'm out of it's sync. It's been an excruciating two years. Can you please let me know when you're going to the bathroom so that I can sync? But yeah, no, I just, once again, you guys put on an amazing con. I am so proud, privileged, and appreciative to be able to part of, be a part of it and see the amazing guests that you lined up. Hey, well, right, so what are we coming up next on the schedule? Next on the schedule. Well, this week for Friday Night Who, which once again is our uh, weekly Doctor Who Watch, we're going to do the first three episodes of the Patrick Troughton story. Which one are we doing? I swears. I swear. I almost said the invasion, and my brain went, no. We already did that. We already did that. Uh, so the first three episodes of the Ice Warriors, now with animation. Woo! Uh, and then, Which all uh, the animation is in the first three. Yeah, it is, isn't it? So we'll get that knocked no, out. right? Not. No, it isn't. One, two no. and three, isn't it? Is it three? is two and three. It, it is two, two and three. three. You're right. Yeah. Two. He's right. Don't talk me out of agreeing with Keith. <laughs> and um, I don't remember what the show is next week, so, you know. Tune in. We'll find out what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> we're doing Sinbad, Eye of the Tiger. Oh, that's right. So you have to watch Sinbad, Eye of the Tiger, because we're going to do Beyond the Doctor. Yeah. Patrick Troughton's uh, uh, movie career. <laughs> and then after that, we will obviously follow up with another three episodes of Ice Warriors for Frank Who, and we will be reviewing Ice Warriors this time with animation and Red Dawn, the big finish uh, Sylvester McCoy. How is it that Glenn knows what you guys are doing and you don't? I, I, thought, I thought it was already. a Peter Davis <laughs> Is it a Peter Red, Red Dawn is Peter Davis. Oh, it is Peter Davis. Yes. Yeah, fifth doctor. Okay, maybe fifth doctor. Doctor. Anyway, <laughs> I, I, I spoil your stuff. Yeah, yeah, I was yeah. thinking. I've got McCoy on the brain since I've been reading. <laughs> All right. Well, and Sean was confused last time with Red. <laughs> yes, thinking right. it was a semester, or a Colin story. I think that's or maybe no, what I did. Uh, I should, uh, Peter. I yeah, shouldn't Peter. have scheduled those two so close together. <laughs> that's what I did wrong. We're going to finalize some uh, some uh, upcoming schedule stuff off mic, but then we will let you all in on it as soon as we know, and that'll take us into uh, the upcoming festivities of Planet Comic Con. So, yay. Okay. Coming soon. Very soon. All right. If that's going to do it for this week, until next week, I'm Glenn. I'm Sean. I'm Mel. I'm Keith. Cheers. Good night, everybody. Bye, guys. We'll see you in the end. 
have been listening to Traveling the Vortex. Doctor Who and all of its associated programs are owned and trademarked by the BBC. No infringement is intended or implied.